Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to hey. IFV 2020. Um, it seems that we are all ready to go. All the technical details are, re are there. So here we are all the chairs that we work hard to get uh, this presentation, uh, this uh, conference very successful. So uh, I am Dan Casas. I'm the general co-chair together with Eric uh, Hines. Uh, Sheldon and Natasha are the papers and program chair. Ari is our um, 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 uh, sorry, um, I don't know what's the technical name for the Aris, but it takes care of the <laughs> social media and, and oh, website. Right. And Zapco is our poster chair. So uh, together we're gonna have a, we're gonna have an exciting week, and I'll leave it to Eric, who's gonna give a quick intro on the, all the logistics and uh, description of how the event is gonna go. All right. Thanks, Dan. And uh, yeah, here we are, I three D twenty twenty. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Um, this is I3D 2020, or the ACM SIGGRAPH Symposium on Interactive 3D Graphics and Games, as we like to say for short. I'm Eric Haynes, and along with Dan, we're both the co-chairs, general co-chairs. In, in an alternative universe far, far away, we would be, let's see if I can get this to advance now, because of course it will, there we go. <laughs> um, we, we would be at ILM Lucasfilm's campus in the Presidio in San Francisco. Uh, I felt it was better to put that photo up than to put up this photo, which is the, you know, inky void that is cyberspace. So let's stick with this. Um, me, I'm in the Presidio campus in my mind. If you look closely, you'll see I'm wearing my super cool t-shirt, or shirt rather, that I got in the before times for the occasion, which is uh, actually handmade by some hipster um, out of kids' bed sheets. Uh, to quote Yoda, and I will spare you my impression, difficult to see, always in motion is the future. As Dan mentioned, we had lots of help putting together the various aspects of this conference. The great content you'll see this week is all thanks to the technical and organizing committees. Specifically, you can thank our papers chairs, Sheldon Andrews and Natalia Tatarchuk, our posters chairs, Dravko Velenov, who has gone above and beyond by making a VR poster space this year, publicity chair, Ari Rapkin, um, I'll try again, Ari Rapkin Blankhorn, who has uh, kindly continued in this position since 2017, and Abdo Garage, who produced the papers trailer in record time. Uh, the whole committee has been essential to making this a successful conference. Here are some registered attendees figures as of a few minutes ago. For this year, this graph is of course not an apples to oranges type of comparison, not even an apples to orangutans. For example, many of you watching have not registered, so we'll not get drink coupons. While we all miss um, meeting up physically, one advantage of a virtual conference is that there can be a much wider dissemination of the presentations. In the past, a few i3D keynotes would make their way onto YouTube. This year, in addition to the keynotes, almost all paper presentations will have a permanent rec recording as part of the i3D channel. However, as noted in the program schedule, one or two will not, so please do keep watching. Our original plan was to have i3D at Industrial Light and Magic's lovely campus in the Presidio. One or two things have happened since then, and we'll see what next year brings. However, we wanted to give a shout out to ILM and Lucasfilm for their continued support through thick and thin. We will hear a keynote from two people from these companies, but more on that later. This year and the next, our lead platinum sponsor is Unreal Engine and the people at Epic who are also providing a keynote. Many other sponsors pledged to support i3D 2020. Because our plans and the world changed, we contacted each one explaining how they were under no obligation to continue their support. I was really happy to hear good news back then from all of them. Each sponsor reaffirmed their commitment and moved their donations to fund I3D 2021. We have still more supporters for this year and the next, for which we're grateful. While the conference is essentially free this year with no real expenses, AMD and NVIDIA are still making a contribution nonetheless. Each is donating a top of the line GPU for our best papers award. In addition, we also have an anonymous donation of a Nintendo Switch as a prize. Award winners will be announced on Friday at the end of the conference. I'm going to hand things over now to Dan, the other general co-chair for I3D 2020. All right. Uh, thank you, Eric, for the uh, uh, nice introduction. 
So now we're going to look a little bit into the logistics that we have planned for this week. Uh, if you want to advance the slide, Eric. Yeah, so as you know, um, uh, all the details about the program are already online in the usual uh, URL for A3D. Uh, we have a um, make available this uh, short link as well. So uh, this year we've prepared a program which is a slightly different than regular uh, I3D program, which is, uh, it was usually just a three-day event. So for this year, in order to make it easier for people to attend the online event, we have split it in five days. So we will have uh, uh, from Monday to Friday this week, uh, three hours, roughly three hours a day uh, content. And it's gonna be uh, streamed uh, morning time uh, in Pacific uh, time zone. Um, our program includes technical papers, invited papers from TVCG and, G and JTCG, and we also have uh, four keynotes and a poster presentation that we will get details later. Uh, if you haven't done so yet, so if you're just uh, watching this on YouTube, remember that you can uh, register for free uh, in the following address, which is also linked in our website. And then if you register, uh, you get a bunch of benefits. So. Uh, we are streaming for free in, in YouTube, but we wanted to get a more uh, interactive experience. So then we have also enabled a Discord server that you can join. So um, uh, once you register, you will get the link to uh, join our uh, Discord server. And the Discord server is a split in, uh, in different channels. So we have, it, we have enabled one channel per each session. So uh, we can discuss each of the content that is presented in each session uh, uh, in individual channels. And then we also have enabled a general channel and a poster channel and an I3D help channel to uh, help you if you have any technical difficulties. So something that we're going to ask you to do when you join Discord is to use your real name. So uh, you probably use Discord for any other gaming server or meet with your friends, and there you use a nickname. But in order to make it easy to connect with people, uh, we encourage people to use their real names. So something you can do with Discord is use a per server uh, name. So we ask you to right click on the i3e server, which is uh, visible in the left hand side in this sidebar. So when you right click on the server, you get this pop up uh, uh, window and then you select change nickname. And this is going to change your nickname just for the i3e server. So please use your real name because the um, goal of the uh, Discord server is that people can reach you out at any moment during this week. So uh, even is it nighttime for him or for, for her, uh, you just can open a query uh, private with, with uh, whoever you want to get in touch with and, and start the conversation. So uh, Discord is meant to be an interactive means of uh, getting in touch with each other at any moment during the week. And then uh, during the uh, during the keynotes and paper presentations, we're gonna read each of the uh, channels and see what questions and discussions were going on there, and then we will bring those uh, into for the Q and A sessions. So please remember to join our Discord server, change your name for the real name, and start uh, getting in touch with each other. Uh, you can also use the YouTube chat to uh, put questions. Uh, when, whenever presentation is going on live, and then we will make sure that we check all these different sources uh, to uh, to get the questions during the Q and A rounds. Um, okay, just for uh, as I was saying before, we have a, a five day event, uh, three hours per day roughly. So this is the lineup for today, which is the first day. Uh, we are starting with this welcome session. Um, uh, then we will have a posters fast forward where we will uh, have a quick preview on what posters are going to be shown on Wednesday. And then we will jump into our first keynote given by Mingling, followed by a live Q&A with uh, Ming. Uh, then we'll have a short break. We will get into our first uh, uh, paper session, which is collision and physics, then another short break, and then we'll go for another uh, second uh, session. So just to remember, um, just to remember that uh, paper presentations are done uh, in a pre-recorded mode. So uh, we already have all the content uh, pre-recorded. And then we will have a live Q&A uh, with all the authors, while keynotes uh, are going to be live. Um, so the first keynote that we have today is Bing Ling. Um, and then tomorrow we have another keynote given by two different speakers, which is Rachel Rose from ILM and uh, Natty Hoffman from Lucasfilm. 
Our third keynote is going to be on Thursday, which is Julian Perre from <coughs> India. And Friday, we're going to have our fourth keynote by David Moore in, in, from Epic Games. Okay, so then, now I'm going to leave it to Sheldon and uh, Natasha, who are our uh, papers program. We're going to give details about the program. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we'd like to thank all of the amazing members of the community who helped us out by putting this uh, program together and reviewing the papers. Uh, so this year, the program committee consisted of 50 members across a variety of industries and academia, and we thank them deeply for their dedication and their help to evaluate the submitted papers. Uh, the conference really wouldn't be possible without them. And speaking of submissions, uh, next slide, please. This year, we had a very healthy number of submissions, 60 in total. And the submitted work really does demonstrate what a broad and dynamic field interactive and computer real-time graphics uh, is. Uh, the accepted papers cover a wide range of topics, including faster simulations and collisions, improvements in rendering speed and real-time lighting, advances in GPU data structures and scene representations, and new ways for interaction in VR, and many, many more, as you'll see this week. And of the 60 submissions, we accepted 17 papers for publication in the I3D Proceedings, and nine for publication in the, the Packham Seagate Journal, which is uh, Proceedings of the ACM on Computer Graphics and Interactive Techniques. This gave us an acceptance rate of 43%, with just 15% uh, going of articles going to Packham Seagate. Um, selection of papers for the Packham Journal was mainly based on maturity of the work and its presentation. Uh, these papers also required a second round of revisions after the, the initial cycle, uh, which was aimed to improve the overall quality and polish of these papers. However, I will add that all of the papers being presented this week at the conference are of, are of excellent quality. Finally, uh, I would like to add that all of the papers are now available in the ACM Digital Library this week and will be ac accessible free. Uh, there's also preprints available on the Discord channels. And now I would like to hand it over to my paper's co-chair, uh, Natasha Tatarchuk. Thank you. So this year, as Sheldon mentioned, with the virtual conference, we have a ton of content for you. With over 26 papers that are accepted to the I3D conference presented. And we mentioned that we have several invited papers. Three of them are from IEEE Transaction on Visualization and Computer Graphics, known as TVCG, and one from the Journal of Graphics Tool, known as um, JCJT. All papers will be presented via pre-recorded videos in each session, with a contiguous set of papers without breaks, followed by about 10 to 15 minutes live Q&A with all of the authors. So now you have an opportunity to not only ask questions from the individual authors of the paper, but if you so wish, even address the whole panel of paper authors. Definitely ask as many questions as you can think. Furthermore, immediately after, you can continue asking questions in the Discord channel for the specific session. And now we transition to Ari, who is our publicity chair. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for I3D. I'm Ari Rapkin Blankhorn, and as the publicity chair, I've been the person behind the social media, the I3D website, and the mailing list all year. We encourage you to tweet or post uh, your thoughts about I3D, especially thoughts about our new virtual format. And if you want to post selfies in your PJs while you're watching the conference from the comfort of home, we'd love to see them. Please remember to use the hashtag I3D20 for anything that you uh, post or tweet. Next slide, please. So I have to remind everyone about ACM's policy about discrimination and harassment. Although this year's conference is virtual, so a lot of this doesn't apply, we do still have many ways to interact with each other and with the speakers. We have the Discord channels, we have Zoom for the town hall, we have the YouTube chat and so on. So this is the policy that governs how we interact and everyone who has registered has already agreed to abide by this policy. So we ask that all attendees familiarize yourself with it if you're not already familiar. There's a link to the policy from the I3D website. If you encounter any issues, you can contact the I3D committee through Discord or by emailing general, uh, the general email address, general at i3dsymposium.org. Next slide, please. Oop. Jumped one. Um, there we go. Just a reminder that discrimination and harassment are not limited to sexual harassment, that there are a number of other types of 
harassment and they are all equally unacceptable. So once again, if there are any problems, you can contact us through Discord or email. Thank you. You know, I'm Zdrav Kuvenev. I chair the poster session and maintain the virtual gallery where you can currently view posters. I'm going to make a few brief remarks because everything is going to be explained in the fast forward section that is following shortly. We have four accepted posters, which will be presented in our official poster session on Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific time. We also have two additional time slots when I will hang around in the virtual posters gallery and provide navigation tips and tricks. On the next slide, here we show a screenshot of our virtual posters gallery hosted on Mozilla Hubs. Make sure to register so that you can log into Discord and get the latest link from the posters channel. And now enjoy the pre-recorded fast forward section of this presentation. Hello, I'm Zdravko Velinov and I chair this year's poster session. I would like to invite you to our virtual posters gallery where we currently host four posters. To access the gallery, you must first log into our Discord server using the invitation emailed to you by our registration system. Afterwards, select channel posters and follow the link in the topic bar. Our gallery can be viewed on any WebGL enabled browser on a personal computer, mobile or VR HMD. You can view posters during the entire conference week. We are also going to have a virtual poster session on Wednesday, September 16th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Make sure to log in to the virtual gallery and interact with the authors. We are also going to take written questions submitted on Discord from the audience. And now it is time to get a short glimpse of what you can expect in our poster session. Without further ado, here are the fast forward videos. Hi, my name is Bagdash and I would like to introduce to you hybrid ray voxel tracing with fixed capacity grids. This technique allows you to produce output that is very close to ray tracing on hardware that has modern memory bandwidth and compute capabilities, yet lacks explicit hardware ray tracing support. Its ability to place an upper limit on the number of triangles tested per cell and to fill generated holes with voxels makes it a suitable alternative to voxels alone for gloss. These features and more equip the technique to readily handle dynamic geometry and procedural destruction. I hope you enjoyed this introduction and looking forward to seeing you at the poster session. Thank you. As part of a project-based graduate course, we developed a computer graphics rendering system and original CG animated short inspired by a popular motion picture. We developed this system using OpenGL with numerous rendering effects, including color bleeding using an approximate many lights implementation and numerous non-photorealistic rendering styles. These styles include a grayscaled noir shader, a lighter Gwen shader, and a stippled cartoon shader. Numerous additional technologies were also implemented, including chromatic aberration and animated graphics panels using alpha maps. The entirety was a collaborative effort between all of the class's 20 students with guidance from Dr. Zoe Wood. Welcome to our poster, 3D behaviors for multi-agent simulations with position-based dynamics. We propose to extend the existing 2D PVD-based crowd simulation approach to use separation planes for collision avoidance, using either preferred or algorithmically determined planes. On the right, the vector in blue shows the vertical collision avoidance and, on the left, the same vector shows horizontal collision avoidance. Here are some results showing, horizontal collision avoidance method on the top, vertical collision avoidance method on the middle and reciprocal velocity obstacle method at the bottom.
More results. Thank you. Sand is a very complex visual object, so in video games, one usually makes some assumptions to have it easier to render. Sometimes it is a static prop, sometimes it is seen at a fixed scale, but we didn't want to make such assumptions. We only rely on the low diversity of grain shapes and their pseudosphericity to develop a method that can render sand consistently at multiple scales and in a fully dynamic setting. It is built around impostors storing pre-computed views of the grains as a little g-buffer which are then used for different rendering. Our approach actually extends to other granular materials and the impostor based model is independent on the complexity of grains. If you want to know more about it, come and see our poster on real-time multi-scale sound rendering. I hope that you enjoyed the fast-forward videos and I would like to remind you that the virtual poster session will take place on Wednesday. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Let's get the conference started with our first keynote speaker, Ming Lin. Ming Lin is an American computer scientist and the chair of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland College Park, where she also holds an endowed faculty position as the Elizabeth Stevenson Eribe Chair of Computer Science. Prior to moving to Maryland in 2018, Dr. Lin was the John R. and Louise S. Parker Distinguished Professor of Computer Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Lin is known for her work on collision detection and in particular for the Lin Canny algorithm for maintaining the closest pair of features of two moving objects. Her software libraries implementing these algorithms are widely used in commercial applications, including computer aided design and computer games. More generally, her research interests are in physically based modeling, haptics, robotics, 3D computer graphics, computational ge uh, geometry, and interactive computer simulation. Today, in the first keynote of the conference, Dr. Lin will present recent advances that integrate classical model-based methods and statistical learning techniques to tackle challenging problems that have not been previously addressed. These include flow reconstruction for traffic visualization, learning heterogeneous crowd behaviors from video, simultaneous estimation of deformation and elasticity parameters from image and video, and example-based multimodal display for VR systems. She will conclude by discussing some possible future directions and challenges. Let's welcome Dr. Lin. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about reconstructing reality from the physical world to the virtual re environment. This is the work done that um, at the University of Maryland at College Park with my students and colleagues and collaborator, as well as um, my colleagues at, and students at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Tsinghua University. Virtual reality or virtual environment was first introduced as the ultimate display, often referring to both AR and VR, uh, as a looking glass into a mathematical wonderland by Evan Sutherland in 1965. It says, if the task of the display is to serve as a looking glass into the mathematical wonderland constructed in a computer memory, it should serve as many senses as possible. And this idea and the concept of serving as many senses as possible is a critical one. It really described the type of display that will go beyond visual, but also our but also through our other sensory um, display, like tactile, haptic, and auditory. In Wikipedia, it has the standard uh, definition about immersive media so, or computer simulated reality. Basically, it is a reality that replicates an environment that simulates a physical presence in places in the real world or an imaginary world allowing the user to interact with that world. 
VR or virtual reality artificially creates sensory experiences, which can include sight, touch, hearing, and smell. This definition reinforces the concept that was introduced by Evan Sutherland in 1965. VR over the years has gone through its ups and downs, just like many other computing technologies. And this is a Gartner hype cycle for VR or the virtual world. You can see over the year, uh, it has uh, gotten a lot of attention in the 80s and um, it, it, it received inflated expectation in the 2000s uh, and went through this dissolution trial uh, by, by the end of 2010 or 2009, around that period. However, around 2014 and 2015, the technology uh, world has become excited again about uh, virtual reality. And this was triggered by the event uh, of the Facebook acquisition of Oculus. The reason um, that Facebook see VR as a new technology is it views VR as a potentially um, other social media where people can interact with each other through multiple senses and sharing experiences. So AR and VR today is one of the most disruptive technologies for the next decade, according to numerous reports from ENT, Forbes, Goldman Sachs, and Holmes Report. Many of the major technology companies are still investing in VR-related technology, ranging from display tracking to headphone and auditory uh, technology and so on. The VR market today is about $22 billion, and it's expected to generate about $161 billion or so by 2025. There are numerous applications, uh, and, and the, you know, the number of applications are really just limited by our imagination. For example, VR has already been used in flight and driving simulators. In fact, it has already been used in, in flight simulator or training pilots. Um, and if you have been fortunate enough to be to Iowa to try out their driving simulator, it's quite an experience. It has been also widely used in education and training um, of operating all different type, type of the, uh, task, as well as uh, training for you know operation as a team. In addition, it's widely used for rapid prototyping and designs of all type of a complex and large structure from power plants to submarines to motor vehicles to aircraft. And here are just a few examples that um, we have worked with at the University of North Carolina. In addition, VR has been widely used uh, much more recently in VR therapy and VR rehabilitations. Here are just a few examples from colleagues and friends at different universities and different companies, uh, ranging from Clemson to University of Florida. It has also been used as a medical training and planning tools for healthcare deliveries. And again, here are some of the examples from either UNC's, um, from colleagues of mine, um, or, medic immersive, um, or immersion medicals um, for a surgical training. Um, or BDI and Google for human uh, for virtual human simulations. And it has also been used um, as a tool for scientific exploration and discovery, like the nano manipulator, which enable the user and the scientists to see a million times bigger of the atomic surfaces that was otherwise impossible to visualize. And this has enabled discovery of new technologies at a nano scale. But one of the very exciting um, experiences will be a shared social experiences, such as cyber travel in space and time that allow us to be at places that we otherwise could not be, enabling um, elderly and friends to share the same kind of experiences that you have uh, wherever you go. And there are some really important problems in VR. And here are just sort of a list of uh, traditional topics that has been heavily worked on, including low latency, large area tracking, immersive display, 3D user interface, interactive 3D graphics, as we will see to, um, at i3D th this year, uh, realistic modeling and simulation tools, uh, intuitive haptic and touch-enabled feedback, real-time 
audio or sound rendering. But today, I'm not going to talk about any of these topics. Instead, I'm going to talk about how do you capture the physical world and bring it into the virtual world that will transcend the boundary between the physical and the virtual world. Data capturing uh, of the physical world is actually a topic of a tremendous interest um, in both computer graphics, in, in VR community, but also in computer vision and, and, and other related um, engineering domain. Um, the data that can capture the real world can range from 2D images, such as photograph, or even hand drawing and paintings, to 3D scan geometries and or either, either capture naturally from the environment or model through tools, as well as high dimensional motion uh, capture of human performance. But it's not just limited to these, but also could be including things like audio recordings, videos of events, and things that we don't typically think about, like the medical information, CD images, ultrasounds, MRI, patient records, as well as sensor data that will capture the, the environment, monitoring the traffic and all kinds of measurements from science experiment uh, to you know the moisture in the soil or in the environment. But you can also include other kinds of documents, including those on the social media and on the web. So the challenge here is how do we deal with the diversity of data representation and format and all these different dimensionality, 2D versus 3D versus undimensional, and the variety of the data itself. Well, some of them are structured, some of them are unstructured, such as text, numbers, images, audio, video, or abstract information. And it could also be things that are very concrete, like geometries, um, physical phenomenon, appearance to things like behaviors and other much, much more abstract informations. And the other challenge is the volume of data that capture the real physical world. It's huge. Not to mention the noises that is that are inherent in the capturing process, as well as the sensor uncertainties and incompleteness of the data themselves. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the recent work that we have done in uh, capturing the physical world for virtual environment. And this is gonna cover just three uh, general broad area that including soft body uh, as represented in human tissues and clothes, multi-agent systems, as we have seen in crowds and traffic, as well as multimodal display. So one of the example for the physical world that I will talk about first is soft bodies, and that will include human tissues and cloth here. Um, cancer classifications is a, a problem that has been studied in medical imaging um, domain for many years. For example, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in men in the U.S. and also around the world. There, there's typically no standard routine um, for um, other than sort of, you know, screening tests, uh, palpations that are being used by doctor's office, but they are not 100% reliable. Uh, the treatments typically including radiotherapy or surgery. Um, and, and so what we are looking at here is the possibility of looking at these medical images that are captured uh, through you know, standard medical imaging technology and then see if we could actually automatically extract tissue properties um, from these medical images and then per perform data analysis and, and develop a predictive model to determine um, if the cancer, if the patient has cancer and what stage of the cancer and what will be the appropriate treatment. And so this is sort of the basic idea. And of course, once we have the tissue parameters, we can also uh, perform various type of reconstruction algorithm to be able to reconstruct the organ of the patients for various type of a pre-op planning and, and you know, surgical training and developing surgical simulator for robots as well. And the basic overview of our proposed system is being shown here, where we are assuming that we have two or more sets of images. And, and we can automatically uh, reconstruct the geometry from these images. And once we have the geometry from these images, we, we can also develop um, uh, simulations with some sort of initial guesses of these el tissue elasticity parameters, and then run a simulation to see and determine if the simulation generate what we observed 
uh, in, in the images that we capture. And if not, we will go through a coupled simulation optimization framework uh, or, you know, couple of simulation optimization loops to continue adjust the parameters until the simulation results reflect what we observed in the medical images. And when we are done, we will have the sets of elasticity parameters that will be patient specific. Um, and so this, the, the basic sets of equation that we use to model the, the deformable body are shown here. Uh, this is governs, this is the sets of equation that govern the deformation and the motions of the deformable bodies. We also use material model um, that, that it's nonlinear. Uh, that's a Mooley Revelin model that we, sh we show here. Uh, and and the, basically, we are formulating this as an optimization problem. And objective function is basically the matching of the or, reconstructed organ surfaces compared to those that we see in the in medical images. Uh, I'm sorry, the, re, the the simulated surfaces compared to what we reconstru what we see in the re, reconstructed directly from what what we see in the images. And so the optimization method that we use here is particle swamp. And the reason is because there are many, many different local minima and the particle swamp will be able to give us a, a global search uh, at a different space to give us the, the, um, the global uh, optimal solutions. And what we have done is that we actually taken these automatically extracted tissue property and we compare that uh, to the, the Gleason scores, which basically um, tell us some information about the stage of the cancer, uh, as well as the, the cancer T stage. And we call, we did a T stage classification based on uh, based on the uh, the prediction uh, using the e extracted patient tissue properties as well as their age, and what we will able to achieve is up to about 91% of the prediction accuracy with the age information. Without the age information, just based on the patient tissue property that was extracted automatically from medical imaging, we were able to achieve about 89%. Uh, similarly, we have done the same with the Gleason score. And, and again, this tells us about sort of how aggressive the cancer is, what stage it is at. And we were able to achieve about 88% with the age information and 81% without. Here is a video that showed the reconstructed image uh, that, that shows the reconstructed organ with this patient specific tissue property and with different tissue property, you would actually see the organ bounce a little bit differently on the on the dish and um, and also indicating how healthy the the organ uh, in, in this particular case prostate will be uh, as you can see healthy versus unhealthy the same kind of technique can be used for you know uh, for also cardio um, cardio images that you have seen there um, and this is a reconstructed heart um, from the cardiogram and my joke is is you can also use this on the video so you can actually determine the Young's modulus for a tennis ball as well and you can use that to determine when you want to throw away your tennis ball so there are many many interesting research directions uh, on this problem uh, that, that we could continue to solve this problem, which, which is what people commonly call as an inverse problem, for more complex and nonlinear models and for multiple materials of nonlinear model for multiple body in contact simultaneously. Um, we can possibly imagine that it can be extended to tearing and cutting of organs, uh, especially when there is actually a change in topologies, and modeling of frictional contacts between bodies and body and fluids. And, and obviously for cancer classification, we could also imagine use a multiple modality of image data as well. Uh, and also be able to using application like Im image guided AR based biopsy. Another example of soft body is cloth. And uh, this is a joint, uh, this is a, a joint collaborations uh, with my colleagues at UNC, but also um, uh, students at Maryland. Uh, and also a research labs, a side stream. And the motivation here is that apparel industry is estimated at over like, you know, about $3 trillion already in 2015. And it continued to grow every year, about 4% every year since then. The U.S. market is one of the largest, but uh, it, it is not the, it, it, it is continued to grow. And 
But yet in the U.S., $1.6 trillion of retail purchasings were done on, on online, but very little is, however, being done for clothing. And part of the problem is, you know, the fitting issue. How well the clothes I buy online fit on me. And in addition to that, um, we, you know, there, there are different research groups that are looking at using robot to help handling laundry. Here is a robot folding clothes at, um, developed at Berkeley. And what we love to do here is to be able to reconstruct garments and fashion apparel directly from images like photographs that you see here. In the examples you see here is that we have a photograph of a possible customer who is walking down the street. And there is a fashion catalog of, of a model wearing a skirt and a top uh, with some accessories. So what we'd love to ask is the question, how would the skirt look on a consumer's photographs? Like the white skirt, can we see how that white skirt might look on the photograph of the consumers? Um, and let's say they change the color to, uh, to green. Um, and how would the wind blow and as the customer walking down the street look uh, with this particular skirt? And so this is sort of the vision that we would like to have uh, and, and be able to, to, you know, to achieve just using photographs for virtual triumphs. So the same vision can be say um, about uh, t-shirt triumphs or pants triumph as you see here, where we have a, 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 a t-shirt that you know, can be demonstrated and can be shown on a virtual model or even better yet on a real, on, on a real human body uh, captured by a photographs. So we have developed this single view image garment recovery uh, system, as you can see here. We are assuming that we have a garment database, which we typically do, and it's generally speaking available on the web um, of sort of some of the most common and most basic uh, garment apparels items like t-shirt and pants and skirt. Uh, we also use um, a large uh, human body database uh, that we capture at MPI. And we have a single view images, as you can see, as input. Our system automatically uh, parse uh, the photographs to determine what's the top, what's the skirt. And then we will use a statistical based methods to reconstruct a human body parameterized uh, by uh, the simple uh, human parameters systems. Then based on the sizing and the features of these um, tops in the photographs, we can estimate um, the, the, the sizes and, and uh, you know, the dimensions of the, the, each one of the garment pieces. And once we have these guesses, we can use it for simulations uh, and the registered garment on the human body uh, we are assuming that, as, as I already mentioned, we have the Garmin database, which will tell us what are the design patterns and sewing patterns. Uh, based on the images, we can estimate the dimensions, and then we can simulate these cloth on the on the extracted uh, parameterized human body. And then we can, again, using the same kind of a couple simulation optimization framework to iterate and adjust all different parameters, both the Garmin parameters the material properties, as well as even, you know, the human body parameters. And when we stop, we have a set of parameters that will capture the human body, as well as the Garmin information, including the material properties. So here's a video demonstrating the basic concept here. So on the left, we have a photograph, um, you know, off the web and in the middle is the automatic extract the um, recover the human body. And on the right is our recovery of the garments and the human body and the simulation results. Um, and with this approach, not only you can use it for performing virtual try on, you can also have uh, the, the extracted um, avatar move around and you can see how the, the clothes that my fit on on uh, you know you, on your avatar, and and here are a few more examples where we have the original images, the the automatically recover uh, body, and also a body on different poses from different angles, so you can compare the original images versus the extracted um, virtual version of the uh, the of the human body, and also the garments as well. 
And here are a few more examples that you have seen earlier where we have this, this is one of the example I, I show you uh, with uh, a user walking down the street. And what we did here is uh, to automatically extract the virtual skirt from the photographs and then be able to put the virtual skirt on this photographs of the human walking down, a, a lady walking down the street. And you can see the wind blowing, can see how the skirt blowing the wing on her body. Um, and here's another example you have also seen earlier where we have a dress uh, that we were able to automatically recover from the images. And then we have a photograph of a different user. We can show how that, that dress will look on a, a new user. And the same idea here, if, if we have an original images of a target garment and we can extract that skirt, that long skirt, and then be able to also do the same and, um, and put that long skirt on other photographs of a lady here and show you how that long skirt will flow on a different on, on the lady here uh, shown in the in the in the photographs. So you can imagine that we can use this kind of tool for all type of virtual triumphs and just by sim using simply images that you capture. So that was an image-based technique. And what I'm going to show you just really quickly is using the similar idea um, to recover the cloth material directly from the videos. And the basic here method here um, that we use is actually a combination of CNN plus LSTM. And, um, and the input that we have are just sort of uh, videos of cloth uh, drape, uh, like, like you see here. These are the input scenarios. Some of them are captured, some of them are simulated. Um, and essentially, we create a large body of simulated cloth, uh, as you, you see here, and then use these simulate a video as a training tool in addition to real video of a hanging cloth. And what we have found was uh, we were able to extract material property or, or the fabric uh, property directly from these videos. Um, on the left are our input in videos and on the on the right, I'm sorry, um, on the right are input videos and on the left um, are the simulated or in, in this particular case, the input videos is on the left. And you can see the simulated uh, materials on the right. And we, this is a great way of taking real physical uh, fabric and be able to clone it onto a virtual avatar. And you can see different input will actually give you a different behaviors on the simulated skirt. Um, and what we, so what we have presented here is a learning-based algorithm to recover cloth material directly from the videos. So there are a lot of really interesting and exciting research issue. Uh, one of the area obviously is interactive high fidelity garment simulation. It, it's still a challenge. And what we'd love to do is to develop visual simulation framework for garment in the cloud uh, for enabling rapid previewing and customer centric design and personalizations. Uh, we also would love to be able to use similar kind of idea for product design optimization for masses as well as automatic material parameter selections based on examples that could be videos, images, or even human drawings. Um, and ultimately be able to integrate some of these data-driven approach with uh, smart fabric and 3D printing. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, some example of physical system that we capture uh, for the virtual environment and in multi-agent system. So smart city is the goal for um, for, for many of the government uh, around the world. And what we love to do here is to equip the city with sensors and be able to enhance um, the, the urban living um, experiences. Um, and so one of the area that we have been looking at was the idea of data-driven crowd simulations. This differ from the prior work where we collect a lot of motion data, we process them offline. What we would love to do is to use a single uh, video clips um, of crowds from some sort of online video library or mobile cameras or or, uh, or any kind of uh, top-down surveillance camera and then use computer vision technology to track multiple people and extract data automatically from these videos directly or other type of, of, of sensor. And the ultimate goal here is to do automatically trajectory extraction from a single videos and to be able to uh, reconstruct these kind of pedestrian behaviors that we observe in the input videos, and then be able to recreate 
a similar kind of scenario or、um, add new elements to the scene, creating new events and changing the environments. Like, for example, throwing a Christmas tree, possibly a, a fire,、um, and, and just you know, asking the what if questions work. So, here is an example a demonstration of what, what I'm talking about here. So, the input data are video,、uh, original、uh, video recording that was taken off the,、um, uh, the, um, the web. And we basically, based on that, that video, s we were able to extract multiple virtual human trajectory, as you see there.、Uh, it, it's spotty and it's not smooth. But with our simulation technique, we were able to smooth those initial trajectories. Create something that looked more realistic, as you can see on the right hand side here, with the slightly different scenarios. We also introduced statue, Christmas tree, and, and added more virtual crowds. And this is a, a different, slightly different layout than what you have seen in the original videos. And we also added more、uh, density or more people into the scene. Here is the example of user interaction with the scenes. Um, and, and as you can see here, the input videos、um, give us the trajectories of multiple pedestrians, which we then used to、uh, create this virtual scene here、uh, and other pedestrian crossing examples. But then we added a new element of explosions, and then we can see how these、uh, virtual crowds behave and respond to the, the explosion that you have seen. The similar idea and the concept can also be expanded. To not just virtual crowds, but also、uh, vehicle as well and, and traffic. And、uh, some of the possible applications would include autonomous driving, where you can actually create virtual traffic、um, and you can use the virtual traffic to train autonomous vehicles. And, and it, it can also be used to、uh, reconstruct the virtualized traffic directly from traffic sensor data that can help doing route planning and add more realism to a virtual earth. And, and can also use it for you know, city reconstructions or city planning for the future. And、uh, this is the work that was uh, taken uh, from one of our SIGRA papers on flow reconstruction for data driven. The basic idea here is that we take the sensor data, as I explained,、uh, from traffic、uh, sensor data. Um, that will measure the velocity of, of the traffic flows、uh, as well as the density. And then, based on these information, we were able to reconstruct the traffic state, which used both、uh, combinations of macro and micro traffic simulation to reconstruct the detailed traffic and the vehicle motions. Here are some of the examples in the scene reconstructed using our approach. Um, and I'm just going to show you one of our videos really quickly as one of the examples. So, here's a top down view where you actually see、um, uh, the high level view of the reconstructed traffic、uh, from the top. And on the lower right corner window, you also see the,、uh, the camera view from one of the driver's perspective. Um, and, and all these are reconstructed based on,、um, based on the technique I mentioned earlier.、Uh, in this particular example, we're actually using a multi agent motion planning technique for these c a r and v e h i c l e to avoid each other and reconstruct their trajectory.、Uh, we have also used other approaches, such as common filter, as a way of steering the traffic flow around. Uh, and here is a scenario where we're actually recreating、uh, a traffic congestion as the car coming along. Here is an example where we're actually showing、um, a, a multi way crossing、um, of a highway with multiple entries. And you can see a God's eyes view、uh, on this particular scenario. And pretty soon, this, this、uh, demo will pivot to the driver's perspective. So, the camera is now tethered to the driver's view. And so you can see the drivers sitting and driving in the car and changing lane as the, as the vehicle drives through、uh, multiple vehicles on the highway. And, it, and now the, the vehicle is exiting and going on and merging onto another highway. So, this is a really very immersive experience because you actually are seeing the traffic flow from the driver's perspective. And that's one of the benefits of, of, of developing、um, you know, 
uh, virtual environments uh, with a virtualized traffic as such, as such that's being demonstrated in videos. Um, here's an example where we actually incorporate some of these technique into uh, training uh, an autonomous vehicle how not to drive. Um, and the basic idea here is that most of the autonomous driving is, is trained by using a real driver. And most of the driving data that we collected from uh, the roads are, are normal driving without accidents. So when you have the scenario as such, where the car is actually driving into to a pole, it would not know how to react. So the basic idea here is we actually are using um, uh, these simulators to create accidents on purpose. So we look through uh, the traffic literatures, uh, traffic engineering literatures, and then create these scenarios on purpose uh, that will create accidents and then have the machine to learn from these accidents how to uh, to learn from these simulated accidents uh, regarding how to react. You can see the difference um, with by, by being able to learn from a simulated accident, the autonomous car or the autonomous vehicle would know how better how to avoid uh, the obstacles on the road, as you can see over there. And this is the generalizations of uh, the controller uh, using this approach that I just mentioned earlier. And you can see how it actually was able to avoid accidents using the trajectory computations um, learned from the simulator accident. So there are a lot of really interesting um, techniques um, that uh, can, can be developed here. Uh, what we have shown here are measurement uh, driven local navigation, reality-based cognitive modeling of the human behaviors. Um, but but uh, what's remaining is how do you simulate more abnormality and unexpected events using some of these model, these human model, and how do you incorporate uh, behaviors that would capture and track into you know novel scenarios. Um, also that how can we explore how can we um, exploit commodity hardware to accelerate and parallelize some of these algorithms as well as developing new matrix and new approach for evaluation and evaluation. Last, I'm going to talk a bit about the multimodal display um, that we capture from the physical world. Immersive multimedia displays are an integral part of any virtual reality, uh, such as some of the system you have seen here. In computer graphics, we use texture quite a bit. However, often uh, we do not take full advantage of them in a VR environment. Uh, in, for multimodal dis rendering. For example, in this particular example, what we see here is a, a pinball table where the ball were being uh, pushed up and uh, um, and, and it just uh, rolling around, uh, creating all kinds of sound. What is going on here, really, it just is simply a flat surface is a render with texture. And the behavior that you observe are largely due to uh, the, the pinball interaction with the texture surface surfaces and that is represented as a normal map. Here is another example where we actually take the images of a Lombard Street straight off the, the web. And we use that images of the Lombard Street uh, for a, a few ball rolling down the Lombard Street in the images as you see here you are probably going to wonder how is this done? Well, it's actually quite simple. We take the images and uh, um, extracted a normal map from the images and used the micro geometry of the normal map uh, to show the interactions between the ball and the street. Now, using this concept and this idea, you could also um, interact um, objects in a VR environment with the textures such that you will show more realistic behaviors as you see here. A ball is rolling on a brick surface. Without the normal map, the ball will not stop at the grooves of the, the brick surfaces. But with the normal map, not only you can interact with it, you can see it roll and behave and sound like the ball rolling on the brick surfaces. We also perform perceptual study on this approach uh, for cross-modal rendering. We have the scene with the rolling ball and the user control haptic pane, 
And we also have um, a different kind of texture material that can be randomly selected for the user to interact with. With this approach, what we have found was when we have uh, all modes turned on, the user have reported the, the greatest ease to interact with the, the ball using the haptic device. And we were able to also achieve the highest reported accuracy in terms of identifying the right texture surfaces. Here are some pos uh, possible application. As you will see here, this is an application to a virtual musical instruments. Uh, what we have here is a, a multi-touch uh, tabletops interface with physically based sound synthesis that generate the audio automatically based on the user interaction with a multi-touch tabletop. Uh, it has acoustic simulation and use many core hardware. Uh, the interaction of the users can be using the ham or uh, various kind of uh, devices, as you will see in the video next. Here are the audio sample, and we use one single audio sample to automatically extract the material. The material that we extracted is from the xylophone bar. So based on that material, we were able to um, use that same material property for the rest of the xylophone of different scale of a xylophone key. Um, and the user will be able to hit on this xylophone and um, generate the song as you heard. I'm just gonna play this one more time. So all the sounds that you heard were automatically generated based on the interaction of the user with a multi-touch tabletop. And that basically uh, was um, what, what you saw there is actually the, um, it's a homemade uh, mallet. Uh, it's basically um, fondue stick with a cat toy stick on the top um, that the user was using to hit the multi-touch tabletop. <laughs> And using the same principle, we can also create a virtual drums so the user can touch the, um, the, the multi-touch tabletop and play the drum directly with the multi-touch tabletop. Our system handles a large number of touches, sound synthesis, and acoustic simulation for multiple sounding bodies all in real time. This makes it ideal for musical pieces played by multiple users. And here's another example of the virtual musical instrument, except the same principle is now being implemented on a mobile device. So you can actually use the system to create your own musical instrument, any kind of virtual instrument you like. Uh, in this particular example, you actually see three different combination of material, uh, metallic strings and wooden bars. demo that you see, uh, the musical instrument was created on the fly by the user and all the sounds were generated on the fly based on the multi-touch interaction between the user's hand and the musical instruments. You see there is actually a, a, a tactile interface. Uh, so so um, the user inputs are being taken as a multi-touch input directly 
convert it into the activation signals to play the instrument created by the user on the fly. So um, just to conclude, um, you know, there's there's just really a lot of really interesting research direction follow some of the work that um, I have demonstrated here in particularly for the multi-modal rendering. Um, we could think of acoustic friendly design for, uh, optimization for buildings, architecture and public space in the city. Um, we can use similar kind of approach for material parameter extraction from multiple video samples using machine learning algorithm. And this is something that we are currently working on. Um, and some of these uh, results can be used to improve telling immersion experiences, like how to bring a remote user being here right next to you when you actually are talking to them uh, through some sort of teleconference uh, tools, uh, which many of us are doing a lot. Um, it, during this pandemic uh, situation. Uh, so you can add the current room acoustic to the virtual speaker's voices as if he or she is in the same room as you are uh, for telepresent or teleimmersion experiences. So to sum up, I have shown in this talk a few example of physical world system from soft body to multi-agent system uh, to use of a multimodal display that will capture the real world uh, experiences from touch and audio auditory experiences. Um, most of these works are multidisciplinary in nature. It requires geometric modeling, physics-based uh, numerical simulations, machine learning algorithms, and statistical inferencing, as well as vision and signal processing technique. Uh, we use a lot of. We also use uh, some of the fundamental principles from data sciences and psychophysics as well as cognitive sciences in modeling all type of behaviors, including human behaviors um, and, and our response to touch and audio signals. Um, I believe more applications, uh, real-time application that can take input from the physical world into developing immersive experiences in VR, AR, or MR system will be needed uh, and need, need to be developed. And so there's there are a re, there there are a, a large number of uh, rich topics uh, for you know for us to work on along this direction. I do want to thank my collaborator and students and colleagues um, who whose work you have seen today, and also want to thank the research sponsor who paid the bill as well as some of the fellowship sponsor as well. I am going to end right here, and I will take questions if there is any. Hello. Thank you for listening to the presentation of the wonderful keynote by Dr. Ling. We have a fantastic set of questions. Thank you for all who have been engaging on the Discord and YouTube to ask the questions. We're going to go roughly in order. So the first question is from the Discord channel. What cloth parameters were being learned? Um, the cloth parameters that uh, the, the, the material parameters that we learn from are based on the paper uh, by Wei Ming Wang, uh, et cetera, all uh, that was proposed in, in their SIGRA papers 2011. So there are 24 different parameters that were being learned automatically through our, our um, algorithms. And we have two different algorithms I talk about. One of them is image-based algorithm and the other one is video-based algorithm. So our algorithm learned directly from either a single view images or um, a, a, a single video clips. And um, as you can imagine, tuning those 24 parameters is a non-trivial task. Um, so the, the, it, there, there was a real need to have an to learn these parameters automatically. Um, so we did not come up with this, the, the sets of parameters, but it's a, a fabric material model uh, that was proposed and it's commonly used, and it's the same sets of parameters that are currently being used in RSIM, and which is an, an open source code many people use for class simulation. Thank you for a comprehensive answer. Next question is from the Discord. Is there value in learning or estimating high-fidelity physical models for autonomous driving applications? For instance, friction or surface compliance or different terrain um, off different terrains or roads? Uh, 
I, I believe so. Uh, I, I think the car themselves uh, know how to deal with the surfaces, but there might still be value to learn uh, these parameters and refine uh, the the you know the control of the vehicle under different circumstances, particularly when the surface is wet, for examples, um, and and um, also the surface is not flat or uneven or you know up sloping downwards. So there's still value to learn these parameters, although that most of the cars are equipped and designed, um, particularly with the tire that would, would develop some traction as they drive, but it was, there would was still be value to, to learn these parameters and refine these estimation through the, the actual driving. Um, so I, I believe in the future that uh, some of these parameters could be learned also from the driving itself, and then it can be used to refine the control of the vehicle and how it drives. Thank you. Question from YouTube. Um, what haptic devices were used to test against the brick texture? Um, we use the, the, the good old fashioned Phantom, six degree of freedom that can sense for both forces and, and torque. Perfect. Um, question from Discord. Regarding geometry interacting with texture normals, for situations where textures may be compressed with some form of block compression, how would the normal features be extracted? How would you deal with artifacts that could arise from, say, low quality, fast compressions? Uh, that's a really good question. We haven't tried that yet. I believe that there will be some level of artifacts due to compression. Um, but uh, the hope is that those artifacts, it's going to be um, minimal to some degree compared to no texture at all. So that you would still have an improved experience using texture for haptic or audio rendering than compared to nothing at all. Um, so we do not know um, the, the fidelity of the texture and its impact on the auditory or the, the haptic feedback. But I believe that the relative, you know, relatively speaking, it's better to have uh, a, a mediocre texture than no texture at all. Thank you, it's super helpful to understand the intuition behind the choices. Question from Discord. Is that a challenging task to build a garment database for cloth si simulation? Um, it, for our example, it wasn't because we were just taking uh, sewing patterns directly available on the web. And it was just, it was already out there. Uh, there is actually a large database of common sewing patterns for t-shirts, for regular shirts, for pants, for skirts, for dresses, you know, standard, uh, non-fancy, non-designers clothes. So we were able to take those just directly off the web, not from any manufacturer. Um, but it would be a challenge to get anything from the designer themselves. And I, I believe those can only be made available to perhaps the supplier or the, the marketing company that will use such a technology for virtual trial. And perhaps this could be a call to action to create a standard that they all can align on to make this task easier in the future. Okay, next question is from Discord. Um, does the table give any um, have any give or compliance or is there any on the horizon? It just seemed to me that it would not match the expected behavior of a drum skin. Do users find that unnatural or tiring? Uh, okay, um, yeah, the table, I, I did not catch the table until now, the multi-touch table. Uh, so, well, I'm sorry, does the table have have any give or compliances? Well, the table is, uh, it's a multi-touch table and actually was built in-house. Uh, so it does have a horizon surfaces. Uh, it does have, um, you know, pressure sensing and that's pretty much it. Uh, it it, it provides essentially a passive feedback so that you know when you touch the surfaces, you know that's the level of compliances you're gonna get. It's the surface compliance, and that's pretty much all. It doesn't push you back. It doesn't, it's not an, hapt, it's not an active haptic device, so it doesn't push you back. The surface itself, it's passive. Thank you. 
Well, with this, uh, we're going to conclude our live Q&A session and we want to extend, extend our deepest thanks to Dr. Lin, who is the pioneer of our um, virtual conference keynotes this year. Uh, many thanks for creating an excellent and extremely educational uh, keynote. We all walk away from learning more about this exciting space and we look forward to more research from you coming in the near and, and further future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha, and I want to thank um, all, the, uh, all the organizers, the chairs uh, for I3E this year. It's especially challenging since this is like the first of its kind. Um, so it, it was not trivial to organize this virtual conference, and I want to thank you all uh, for, for inviting me and, and the experience to share this special uh, pioneering experiences of holding the first virtual I3D. Thank you all. Many thanks. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to transition uh, for a short break and then we will be switching off to um, our first paper session of the conference. Please stay tuned.
Uh, well, I presume that we're live for uh, I3D. Yep. Yes. Yes. All right. So well, welcome to the first session, the collisions and physics session. Um, my name is Paul Cry from McGill University. It's my, happy, uh, my pleasure to be uh, sharing this session with a, a pretty awesome collection looking at papers. Uh, so just to introduce the authors and the papers that you'll have in the session, the first paper is Local Optimization for Robust Sign Distance Field Collision. Uh, be presented by Miles Macklin, a computer graphics and simulation researcher working for NVIDIA on the physics team, um, currently based in Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, co-authors on this paper include Ken Yerleben, Matthias Mueller, uh, Natapong Chintanez, uh, Stefan Jeschake, and Zach Korsé, if I got these names right. I hope I got them right. And, and this is a collaboration between NVIDIA and the University of Copenhagen. Uh, the second paper is a uh, time-independent deformer for elastic rigid contacts in the, uh, uh, and uh, this will be presented by uh, Camille Brunel, uh, and she's a third-year PhD student at INRIA Bordeaux under the supervision of Pierre Benard, uh, Gael Gunnarbaud, and Pascal Barla, who are co-authors on the paper. And the, uh, the third paper in the session is going to be real-time muscle-based facial animation using shell elements and force decomposition. Um, uh, Jungmin Kim is the first author, a graduate student from uh, Computer Graphics Lab at Ewa Woman University in Korea. Uh, and um, and uh, Jungmin Kim is actually currently an associate research engineer at the uh, Research Center of KT Corporation uh, with the uh, immersive media team. And the co-authors of this paper include Mingi Choi and Young Kim, also from Ewa Women's University. So uh, welcome to all of you. Um, I, I guess uh, we go straight into the uh, the papers at this point, the presentations. Yep, and uh, we'll come back for Q and A afterwards. All right. Hi everyone, my name's Miles. I'm going to present our paper, Local Optimization for Robust Sign Distance Field Collision. This was work that was done in collaboration with Kenny Erleben at the University of Copenhagen and my colleagues at NVIDIA, Matthias Muller, Natapong Chintanez, Stefan Yeschke, and Zach Kors. So just to give a quick recap on sign distance fields, I think most people listening will be familiar with them, but they can be thought of as a function phi that we evaluate at a point in space, and it gives us back the distance to the surface of some object. And we typically use the convention that when phi is negative, we're on the interior of the shape, when it's positive, we're on the exterior, and when phi is zero, we're lying on the isosurface of the shape. And so this is a really nice property of SDFs that they have this inside-outside information, and in contrast to something like a, a explicit surface-based representation such as triangle meshes or convex meshes, this is uh, really useful for collision detection. They can be implemented uh, and stored as either something like a, in a discrete way, like a volume texture, which makes them quite friendly for the GPU, or just as an analytic expression. And I think it's really interesting that there's actually um, a nice collection of, of SDF uh, functions for some really complex shapes. So this example on the right is a horseshoe, and the SDF uh, has a closed form expression, um, despite the fact that it's you know quite quite complex and, and non-convex. So how do we use SDFs for collision detection? Well, typically we, we, for some point or some particle X, we introduce a constraint that says that the particle must stay greater than some radius away from the surface. And for contact, we generally need two things. We need the normal, and that's given by just the gradient of the, the sign distance field, and that can be computed using finite differencing or, or analytic gradients. And we need the closest point on the surface. And that's given by this expression at the bottom, and essentially x minus the gradient times the distance. And there's a common misconception, I think, that this is in some way an approximation of the closest point projection. In fact, it will give the closest point on the shape for almost all points in space, except for some special cases like the medial axis of a shape. And that at that point, the closest point is, uh, is not unique. There's potentially more than one point at the same distance. And in that case, the gradient is, is not a simple function anymore. But we typically try and avoid that case, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So 
I have mentioned that, you know, we query SDFs at a point in space. The topic of this paper and, and the question that we try and answer is how do we extend this to a, a surface, not just a point in space? Because you can imagine if we have a piece of cloth represented as triangles, we want to collide the entire surface against the, the, the distance field. And so one natural approach uh, is to essentially point sample the surface. And that's kind of what we're doing when we test the vertices. But you can go further and, and add more samples on the interior of each face. And the, the figure on the right here is uh, showing one particular sampling strategy. This is a low discrepancy sequence from the rendering community. But it works reasonably well you know, for, for, um, for, for collision detection as well. And the advantage of, of sampling like this is that it's very simple. You can just run the same algorithm just for, for multiple points on the, the element, and it's potentially highly parallel. The downside is that it generates a lot of contacts uh, for a start, and you can still miss features, right? You've, you've still got a finite uh, sampling. And so just to illustrate how this looks, uh, if we have an example like this where we're just testing the vertices, the black spheres, you see with a sharp SDF, you quickly get the slipping through the cracks problem uh, and get large interpenetration. If we go further, and in, in this example, I've, I've added like 64 interior samples. They're not visualized, but, but uh, we have 64 interior samples for each triangle. And you can see that it does a little better, but we still get some interpenetration and uh, eventually the shape is ejected from the cloth. So the approach that we propose in this work is to essentially solve a small optimization problem for each uh, uh, element, which can be a line segment or a, a face. And we try and find the closest or the, the deepest point uh, inside the shape for each element. And we're going to generate a contact at that point. So to phrase this mathematically, we, we can write it down as an optimization problem. Okay. On the, on the domain of an edge or a face. And the goal is to minimize the, the value of the SDF on that domain. And, you know, the SDF can be arbitrarily complex, I would say, you know, often nonlinear, potentially non-convex. So we can only really hope for a, a local minimum of, of the SDF on the shape. Uh, to find a global minimum, you, you can imagine like a, a very noisy SDF, for example, to find the global minimum would be, be very hard and, and, you know, you might look at something like a branch and bound approach, but we uh, restrict ourselves to, to finding a local minimum, which is often sufficient for, for doing uh, contact. So I want to discuss a few methods for, for, for solving this kind of problem. The simplest possible one you can maybe uh, uh, imagine is, is something called projected gradient descent. And the idea here is that we, we start at some point on the triangle, we take a step, and if we step outside the, the domain, we're going to project back onto the, the element. And so the entire algorithm can be written down uh, in this fixed point iteration as x plus 1, uh, xi plus 1 equals the projection of xi, minus alpha, which is our step length, times the gradient. And so this method is very simple, but it does have the disadvantage that you have to pick an alpha, uh, which is like a step length parameter. And doing this in general can be uh, kind of time consuming. It's not something you really want to do uh, across a large range of assets. But the good news is that um, in this case, the SDF, the gradient has a unit magnitude, and this is a property of, of sine distance fields. And so what this means is that alpha actually has a nice geometric intuition, which is that it uh, represents a distance uh, to step. So this gives you some, some ability to, to pick it with um, you know, some geometric intuition. The second method I want to discuss is uh, called the Frank Wolf method. And I was really pleased that I uh, had a, a chance to use this in practice. It's a neat uh, algorithm because it doesn't require any projection operation, uh, surprisingly. And not only that, it doesn't require a step length to be chosen. So the step length is given by the algorithm itself. And the way the method works is that essentially we start at some point, we linearize the objective, which is just like finding the, the normal. And then we, we pick the vertex 
of the domain, the vertex of the triangle, that is furthest along this linearized direction. And we just move towards it a little bit. And, and we repeat that process, and surprisingly, this will converge to a minimum. Uh, again, it assumes convexity of the objective, but, uh, but it will find a local minimum, even for the non-convex case. The last method I want to mention is something called golden section search. I think of this as, as like a generalization of bisection uh, to, to optimization problems. So bisection can find the roots of a nonlinear 1D function, and golden section search can find a local minimum. It's only applicable to 1D though, so this is only really for line segments and edges. And it uses a recurrence based on a Fibonacci sequence to essentially uh, bracket the, the minimum and refine the interval that we're searching on. So the algorithm that we're proposing can be summarized like this. For each element, line segment, or triangle, we're first going to perform an early culling step this is optional, but it's really an effective way to, to cull out and discard a lot of uh, additional work. And essentially all we have to do is build the bounding sphere of our element, test the, the, the center of it against the SDF, and if, it, if the distance is greater than the radius, we can discard the element and move on to the next one. If we pass that test, we pick a starting point, either the, the centroid of the triangle or the vertex with the minimum SDF value as our starting iterate. And then for some fixed number of iterations, this is what we usually do, we will take a step of our optimization method. At the end of that process, if the value has dropped below the SDF or below the contact distance, then we're going to create a new contact and output it. So here's an illustration of this. I, I implemented the method as a, a shader toy. And here the visualization is uh, showing the closest point on the line segment and on the on the SDF. So the green dots represent the iterates. This is, I think, projected gradient descent being visualized here. And you can see how they, they essentially start at the midpoint and they move towards the, the minimum across the line segment. And you can play with this online. Um, and as you go inside, you see it works pretty well. I just want to point out one limitation here is that when you cross the medial axis, like I mentioned, the closest point is no longer unique. So what you get is some flip-flopping. You know, It's kind of arbitrary which side you're going to end up on. There's no global uh, information here. So this is one limitation, but um, generally in collision detection, we try and avoid these, these types of deep penetrations uh, and, and prevent them happening. Um, before we get to the, the crossing over the middle of the shape. So let's have a look at how, how this works on the, on the cloth example. Um, you can see now we, we do much better, I think, than the, the 64 times sampling and generate many fewer contacts as well. So here we're generating one contact per triangle and just optimizing its location using the, method, uh, the methods we just discussed. Here's a more complex example, but the same idea. The you know you can see the interpenetration. This is just doing vertex sampling, and we get large interpenetration with the spikes on the dragon. If we do face sampling, we get uh, a nice robust uh, contact gen, even with some some pretty large motions. And this is a one D example uh, that could be like. Um, sort of a rope or something like that. And here we're testing one vertex, and you can see on the lip of the object there's quite a lot of interpenetration. Uh, if I show the equivalent with golden section search, you get you get nice robust contacts. And so you, I think this would be quite useful for something like uh, here, for instance. Our method is applicable to rigid bodies as well. This example, each shell, uh, has a, a around 120,000 triangles along with an embedded SDF. And I think the total here is around 1.2 million uh, triangles, but the, the collision detection time is only around um, 500 microseconds on the GPU. And we did a convergence analysis. And for, this, for these plots, what we've done is um, 
with the, the horseshoe example again, we've chosen a, a domain and we've randomly positioned a, a element, a line segment over the domain in any you know, uh, potentially independent rating shape. And we've run that test over a thousand or so uh, random configurations and plotted the relative error uh, over the itera each iteration of the optimization loop. And so you can see that projected gradient descent has quite a large variance, and that means that there's a kind of like a more noise in the iterates, but it quickly gets down to, to you know, something quite low that matches the reference solution. Frank Wolf, on the other hand, has a lower variance, so this means the error is more smooth, but it has a longer tail, and that's a side effect of the uh, step length size that gets chosen for Frank Wolf. And finally, uh, golden section search. Again, this was a 1D problem, so we could apply golden section search. And this has a, a low variance and a, a very low error at the end of the, the, the uh, optimization. So the takeaway here is that if you have a 1D problem, you should choose a search-based method. Um, they're generally more robust and efficient than descent-based methods. I mentioned that you can, you know, store at, uh, SDFs as analytic functions, and here's an example of one of those. Uh, this is just a, a small mathematical one that I uh, came up with, subtracting a couple of different shapes, and you can create really uh, interesting uh, scenarios like this. I think that would be quite difficult with triangle meshes. And our method can be used with um, some of the extensions uh, of SDFs to deformable bodies. The idea here is that you embed the SDF inside like a deformable cage, and what we do is we basically project the entire element back to material space, perform the optimization, and then project back to world space. And you can see an example of this here. Even though the, the cage is very coarse, the tetrahedral mesh is very coarse, the collision detection is still um, quite accurate and, and follows the, the surface closely. So for future work, uh, you know, we would like, we have assumed that there's still some surface representation that's our query mesh. Uh, in the future, you know, we think it would be interesting to look at things like pure SDF versus SDF contact. Um, and the fact that you can take the intersection of two SDFs very easily suggests that, you know, there's, that there's an interesting uh, way to do this or an efficient way to do this. And of course, we could imagine higher order optimization schemes. We focused on first order ones for simplicity, but you could use Newton or accelerated methods. And finally, just one limitation of our method is that we've assumed one contact per element. For a scenario like this on the right, where you have a line segment over the comb, you might want more than one, right? Like you might want at least two. Uh, and so you could do something like an implicit subdivision um, and then follow that by this optimization refinement. Uh, but we didn't find that this was a major limitation for most of the scenarios we, we cared about. So I'll leave you with some references and uh, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of I3D. Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present our work on surface deformation due to elastic rigid contacts. Collision between a rigid and an elastic body, such as a finger pressing on a rubber balloon, is commonplace in 3D animation. In such configurations, we expect the elastic object to squash inside the contact region and to bulge outside of it as its volume gets redistributed. These effects are crucial to produce plausible deformations, but they are notoriously difficult to generate and control in computer graphics. In this work, our goal is to automatically produce such local surface deformations in a not directable way. We won't deal with global deformation that would affect the rig of the object. We are not aiming for physical accuracy either, but plausibility. For instance, it is often desirable that the volume of the deformed object is preserved to a certain extent. Nevertheless, we want to give users the possibility to control the shape of the bulge and even exaggerate it when cartoon effects are desired. The deformation of elastic objects has been addressed by a wide range of methods, 
from accurate physical simulations to artistic manual approaches. Here, we focus on methods that deal with local deformations. Simulation methods are physically accurate and result in realistic deformations, but they are difficult to control by an artist and must be computed after the animation stage, since each frame depends on the previous ones. At the opposite end of the spectrum, blend shape and post space deformation methods provide full artistic control and their simplicity enables instant feedback. However, the price for this control is the amount of artist work needed to sculpt and animate the desired deformation for every object and even every contact configuration. In the context of character animation, quasi-static simulations can produce partially time-independent deformations, but they need to solve a large set of nonlinear equations iteratively, which is unsuitable for live user interaction. Finally, a few procedural deformers have been proposed by CG artists, such as the deformer of Wang. They resolve the collision with a purely geometric approach, offer control over the deformation, but they don't take into account any physical properties of the elastic object, not even its volume. Our method addresses this limitation. Our objective is to offer a time-independent deformation tool which allows interactive feedback and nonlinear editing of the animation. Each frame of the animation thus needs to be processed instantaneously, irrespective of the past and future, but the resulting deformation should be continuous in both space and time. To make this problem tractable, it will only handle contacts between an elastic and a rigid object, but produce art directable building effects while ensuring plausible deformations by preserving the volume of the elastic object. Let's start with a quick overview of our method. At each frame, we consider two objects in the intersection, one rigid and one elastic. In this figure, the purple finger is rigid and the black surface is elastic. First, we detect with an edge face intersection test the exact intersection points between the two objects, illustrated with the red crosses here, and we extract the regions in intersection, depicted with dashed lines. We then fully resolve the collision by finding a mapping between the two regions in intersection, depicted with the dashed arrows. We project the elastic surface under the region one following this mapping. We now determine the zone where the object will remain in contact, highlighted in red, taking into account their respective shapes and stiffness. We finally deform the elastic surface from the boundary of this contact zone until a user-controlled pseudo-geodesic distance is reached, following a direction field, depicted here with the arrows, whose magnitude is controlled by a 1D profile curve such as this one. By construction of this profile curve, we ensure that the volume is approximately conserved and that the resulting deformation is C1 continuous at both extremities of the deformed region. I will now present the main steps of this pipeline with some more details. To resolve the intersection between the two objects, we need to project the elastic mesh onto the rigid one. We do so by matching the pairs of exact intersection points of each mesh in parametric space. First, we roughly align these pairs of points using a least squares global affine transformation and then locally refine this transformation with a smooth 2D deformation field obtained by harmonic diffusion of displacement vectors. After this projection, we determine the region where the two objects will remain in contact, the contact zone. We observed empirically that the stiffer the elastic object is, the smaller the contact zone should be. Based on this observation, we linked the stiffness of the elastic object to the radius of a virtual ball that would roll on the interior of the elastic surface projected onto the rigid one. The contact zone corresponds to the region of the surface that can be accessed by this ball. We developed a fast algorithm approximating this idea, the ball testing. For each projected vertex PI prime of the elastic mesh inside the intersection, we search if any other vertex of the projected elastic surface is inside the ball of radius Rs and center Ci. 
If so, the current vertex is not in the contact zone. Choosing a smaller sphere, that is, a more elastic object, results in a larger region, highlighted here in yellow. At this stage, the contact zone is discretized at merged vertices, which leads to objectionable temporal artifacts when its boundary evolves during an animation. To refine it further, we compute the continuous exact boundary points on the outgoing edges of this discrete contact region. To do so, we slide the same virtual ball along each of these edges until it touches the elastic surface. More precisely, let's consider this edge with the vertex PI prime inside the contact zone, depicted in red, and a vertex PJ prime outside it, in green, due to the presence of the other point P prime. The ball is defined by the same radius RS as previously, and its center C of alpha is obtained by linear interpolation between C of 0 and C of 1, with alpha the parametric location along the edge. We search for the smallest alpha at which the ball is tangent to another vertex P prime, which boils down to solving this quadratic equation. In this video of an elastic plane deformed by a rigid ball, we use two different sphere radii to illustrate the contact zone detection. As expected, using a larger radius results in a smaller contact zone and the plane looks stiffer. Now that the contact zone is defined, we need to smoothly deform the surface around this region. The final position of each vertex pi prime is determined by the following equation. The deformation is defined along a direction field d, whose magnitude is controlled by a family of 1d profile curves h. These curves are parameterized by a normalized pseudo-geodesic distance field u and defined by six control points. V0 and V1 are automatically adjusted to ensure a smooth transition with the contact region according to the amplitude and slope at u equals zero. V3 to V5 are a fix for all curves to ensure that the deformation smoothly vanishes at the external boundary of the deformable region. Finally, the ordinate of V2 controls the volume preservation and the bulging of the deformation. By default, it's automatically determined to ensure approximate volume preservation, linearizing the computation of volume variation over the deformable region. To evaluate this equation at each vertex pi, we have to know the value of the amplitude ai and the slope si not only for the vertices at the boundary of the contact zone, but over the whole deformable region. Since those values are expected to vary along the contact zone boundary, we compute them through harmonic diffusion with boundary constraints ensuring C1 continuity between the two regions. We compute the parameterization U using a slightly modified version of the heat method of Crane and colleagues. In particular, we need to take into account linear constraints along the continuous boundary of the contact region by properly weighting the partially included triangles, illustrated here in red. Please refer to the paper for details. The resulting parameterization, depicted here with gray periodic isovalues, respects the boundary constraints, is smooth, almost linear, and readily symmetric when expected. The extent of the deformation can be controlled by the user through a maximum geodesic distance parameter. The direction field required by our method is subject to two constraints. It must match the fixed displacement of the contact zone and for its smooth shape, it should be mostly aligned with the surface normals. If we perform a simple harmonic interpolation between the 3D vectors across the deformable region, it won't behave as expected. Instead, we need to take into account the change of orientation over the surface. To do so, we project each vector di on its local tangent plane and interpolate these 2D tangent vectors using harmonic diffusion while accounting for parallel transport. We show here in blue the projected direction field obtained using this diffusion process from the constraints in red. 
Unit 3's directions are eventually recovered by the inverse transformation. It's now time for results, starting with a collision between two capsules in different configurations. Note that on all of those examples, the amplitudes and slopes exhibit a high variation along the contact zone boundary. Notice the temporal continuity of the deformation, even though each frame is processed independently. We provide several user control possibilities. The simplest one is a single scale of volume modulating the magnitude of the bulging effect, either cancelling it, as shown at left, or exaggerating it, as shown at right. In addition, the profile curve offers even more artistic controls. For example, we can adjust the abscissa of V2 and V3, as shown in the center, or add a sinusoidal function to mimic wrinkles, as shown on the right. In this animation, we compare our method to a finite elements simulation in Udini side FX and to the Icolite procedural deformer for Autodesk Maya. As you can see, our method is able to faithfully reproduce the bulging effects observed in the simulation, whereas Icolite produces obviously different results. In this interactive example, we show a solid ball colliding into a torso animated with linear blend scanning. Note that the pose is modified while the deformer is applied live, and that we can still modify the bulging parameters until we obtain the desired deformation. Finally, we show two more scenes that illustrate more complex configurations. On this hand pillow contact, there is only one intersection zone, but multiple disconnected contact regions are merging and splitting during the animation with temporal coherence. In this second case, we can see that the deformation is perfectly smooth and stable in space and time, while the finger slides along the surface of the octopus. Of course, our method comes with some limitations. First, it's sensitive to the quality of the mapping between the two surfaces. If this mapping exhibits strong distortions and stretching, discretization artifacts can appear on an unsampled contact zone, as shown here with this very deep collision between two spheres. Ultimately, when the small sphere moves beyond the surface of the bigger one, we cannot generate any deformation response as there is no geometric intersection. In conclusion, we have presented a purely geometric, time-independent and art-directable deformation technique that works directly onto input surface meshes. As future work, Beside performance improvements and exploration of authoring tools to control the deformation on isotropy, we are investigating the extension of our approach to the intersection of two elastic surfaces with possibly different stiffness parameters. Thank you for your attention. This is Jungmin Kim, and today I'm going to present paper titled as Real-time muscle-based facial animation using shell elements and force decomposition. In the presentation, I will introduce the research and related work as follows, then show the face model proposed in this study and the dynamic model applied to it. After that, I will show the results of experiments and then conclude my talk. The goal of this research is to generate real-time physics-based facial animations in an anatomically plausible way. Thus, the proposed system could be mimic the anatomical features of human face by modeling the explicit facial muscles as shell elements showing real-time simulation performance. Challenges for this research are first, we need normalization and simplification for complex face models that are defined differently for each person and physical interactions between the elastic bodies of the face model. In addition, as the deformation of the human face is caused by multiple muscles and external forces, there is a challenge to solve the coupled problem. Finally, real-time integration should be performed for nonlinear facial deformations. This work's main contribution is, first, biomechanical deformation with a novel face model. The face model with a simplified structure is designed 
and the physical interactions between the elastic bodies are implemented. Second, real-time simulation of nonlinear facial deformation is implemented through motor analysis. Real-time integration is possible by reducing the degree of freedom of the governing equation using motor warping. Third, it approximates the coupled animation into a decoupled system. The proposed system can mimic a combined facial deformation by independently obtaining the displacement of each muscle through decomposition of the forces that are exerted on the skin. In computer graphics, studies on muscle-based modeling are implemented. For example, real-time volumetric muscle deformation, muscle simulation that is deformed by bone movement, and flesh simulation using various elastic mass property models were also conducted. However, most are not real-time simulations, and the studies did not consider any anatomical facts about the facial structure. Facial animation can be divided into a kinematic method and a physical method. First, as kinematic method, there are studies showing geometric facial deformation using marker-based motion capture or markerless facial tracking through depth sensor. In addition, studies were conducted through facial rigging by using the facial action coding system or muscle insertion and wire connections. In this case, real-time performance can be obtained, but it does not consider the anatomical characteristics and physical phenomena of facial system. For dynamic approaches with anatomical properties, there are studies that modeling facial tissues and muscles in real time using deformable lattice, and modeling them as an explicit tetrahedral element and apply FEM simulation. All of them, considering the elastic bodies under the skin, implemented physical interactions between them. To prevent inappropriate tessellation due to the thin structure of the muscles, Studies have been conducted by embedding the muscles within the tetrahedral elements of elastic body. The method of controlling the facial muscles by using experimental weight and optimization were proposed. For multiple muscles are involved in skin deformation, superposition of the muscle deformation is also conducted. However, previous studies with tetrahedral elements do not show real-time performance and they are subject to tessellation problems, also difficult in explicit muscle design, which has limitations in system scalability. For real-time FEM simulation, this research is based on governing equation and energy functions proposed by motor warping and real-time thin shell simulation. This introduces a geometrically derived shell element energy function. The shell element is composed of a triangle mesh. Membrane energy associated with the deformation of stretch and shear is as follows. Both energy functions are designed to resist deformation for the undeformed state of the shell element. Stretch energy is for the area of the element and shear for the edge length of it. The flexor energy function for the bending motion was derived by the average curvature of each point of the shell element. Finally, the total elastic energy including stretch, shear, and bending appears as a linear combination of stiffness values for each motion. Differentiating the elastic energy with respect to the displacement value is the elastic force and thus the nonlinear stiffness matrix K. Using the calculated stiffness K, mass M, and external force F matrices with rarely damping, the governing equation can be described as follows. To integrate the given equation in real time, motor warping is introduced by assuming nonlinear stiffness matrix as linear. By solving the generalized eigenproblem for the given M and K, motor displacement matrix phi and motor amplitude matrix Q can be obtained. Using phi and Q, we can reduce the number of dimensions by expressing the motor displacement U as an expression for Q so that the real time integration is possible. And then, we design muscle-based face model. The facial structure is made up of complex and unstructured elastic bodies. Therefore, we simplify the face model with four layers of skin, muscle, subcutaneous fatty layer, and skull. Each of layers should be interpreted as a dynamic model based on anatomical facts. First, the skin and facial muscles are assumed to be shell elements because they are thin elastic bodies. 
In the case of subcutaneous fatty layer, it is assumed homogeneous mass spring system, which act as a connection between the muscle and the skin node. For the skull, to mimic the muscles and skin nodes which are attached to the skull, a static position constraint was applied. With template skin mesh, four muscles are selected to be designed that can include large deformations. These are the muscles that put the tail of the mouth upward, put the front of the eyebrows down and upward, put the lower lip downward, and put the tail of the mouth downward respectively. The position of the muscle was set in consideration of the skin mesh and it was modeled as a curved shell. As it is designed to be explicit, the face model is composed independently with the skin mesh. Next chapter is physics for the elastomers of the face model. First, to control the deformation of the facial muscles. Since the facial muscles mainly contract and relax, by using motor analysis, we ensure that the shell elements only undergo stretch deformation. In motor warping, lambda n is eigenvector determine the deformation mode which represent the column of the phi matrix. In our case, as the third mode represent the stretch mode, only the stretch deformation can be reflected by setting the other components of the phi matrix to be zero except the third column. Activation force must be applied to the muscle. As an activation force, a tangential force was applied to each muscle node as an external force. For the origin of the muscle where it is attached to the skull, we apply a static position constraint. Thus, in the governing equation, the degrees of freedom of these nodes are ignored. The force generated by the muscle movement is transferred to the skin as the elastic force of the subcutaneous layer. According to Hooke's law, the magnitude of the elastic force is determined by the difference between the initial spring and the spring that is deformed by muscle deformation. In addition, we set the direction of the elastic force by getting the moving direction of spring node that is attached to the muscle. This calculated mass spring force is exerted as an external force on the skin node. As the muscle that pulls the tail of the mouth does not change the area of skin around the eyebrow, the area of skin that is deformed by specific muscle must be limited. The restricted area region of interest is defined as follows. For the muscle nose and the skin nose, we define the initial spring that connects them at the shortest distance. In addition, by setting the alpha, which is the range value that the muscle can affect, the skin area located within the alpha becomes the region of interest. Now I will explain how to implement the coupled deformation. The total external force exerted on the skin is linearly independent depending on the type of external force, so linear decomposition is possible. To implement combined skin deformation, first separate the external force according to the type and obtain an independent displacement for each skin mesh. Finally, because displacement is also linearly independent on the type of deformation, we can simply add all of them to get the desired skin deformation. Let me show the simulation results. Here are the implementation details. We made use of real-time thin shell API from Chesswork and Maya plugin for C++. The skin mesh consists of about 7300 nodes, 14,000 shell elements. In the case of the muscle mesh, simulations were conducted for about 30 mid nodes and 60 shell elements. This is the result of muscle deformation. It shows average 200 frames per second. Left video shows muscle contraction. And right video shows relaxation. This is skin deformation resource that is caused by specific muscle and its region of interest. With respect to the muscle that pulls the tail of the mouth upward, whether only the right muscle is contracted or when both muscles are contracted, you can see that the tail of the mouth goes up. In the case of the muscle that pulls the lower lip down, you can see that the lower lip goes down due to the contraction of the right and the both side muscles. For the muscle that pulls the tail down, you can see that the tail of the mouth goes down due to the contraction of the right and the both side muscles. Finally, for the muscles that move the eyebrows, both contraction and relaxation cases were simulated. 
you can see the front eyebrows goes down when it contracts. And goes up when it is relaxed. The performance of facial animation for each muscle type and its region of interest is over 90 frames per second, mainly in the mid-90s. For the gravity simulation, the feature points are fixed as shown in yellow and blue points in the leftmost image. As the stiffness of the skin is reduced, the skin around the eyes and under the cheek is gradually dropped. To verify that the combined skin deformation through forced decomposition was successful, we first checked the simulation result for the multiple muscles case. For the muscles that pull the tail of the mouth upward and the muscles that pull the lower lip downward, you can see that the tail of the mouth rises and the lower lips press downward with muscles contraction. Next, the skin is deformed by the muscle deformation with external force. Combined skin deformation due to the muscle that pulls the tail of the mouth upward and the external force that pulling the right cheek can be seen in real time. This is the transition between the expression when the tail of the mouth is raised and lowered. You can see the change due to the muscle's contraction and relaxation and contraction again. As the muscles and skin are modeled independently and the mass spring connection between them is automatically established, there is no difficulty in simulating user-specific mesh. For the user-specific skin mesh, you can see the tail of the mouth goes up and goes down, and the result of the lower lip goes down at the same time as the tail of the mouth goes up. Simulation performance is from 73 to 85 frames per second, so we are able to see real-time performance for all face animation results. I will conclude my talk by reviewing main tasks. This study presents real-time muscle-based facial animation using novel facial framework based on motor warping for shell elements. The face model was designed geometrically and physically based on the anatomical facts of the human face. Through forced decomposition, the deformation when multiple external forces are applied to the skin was simulated, and real-time physics-based animation was shown using motor warping. The limitation and future work of this study are as follows. Currently, it does not consider the rigid body dynamics of the skull, but it can be integrated into the system with jaw kinematics. Also, muscles are controlled experimentally at this moment, but the maximum amount of stretch can be controlled through inverse dynamics. Thank you for listening to my talk. If you have any further question, please email to the address. All right, I guess we're back to uh, we're back to the uh, the session. I didn't get to watch the very end of the conclusions because the time delay, but. I think I can see them. Anyways, um, fantastic session. Let's start with the uh, SDF collision detection and Miles. This is an awesome paper. I um, I have a quick question to start things off, and I, I see there was a lot of discussion on the um, on the on the channel as well. So when you're doing the Frank Wolf method, you start. I presume uh, you said that you chose either the minimum of the three vertices or the center, uh, and I was wondering, like in this case of the uh, like the, uh, the the comb, if there is any interest in potentially on every frame choosing a random starting point because stochastically you might end up catching enough of the collisions. Did you, yeah. did you, how, how much did you explore like different starting points for these tricky cases of ugly SDFs? Yeah, so we didn't really explore it in terms of, you know, um, trying to find better local minima or better minima. Um, I mean, more about also uh, the accuracy to which you converge to something, right? Um, but I think, uh, yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to try the random randomization. I think for contact, though, you know, we, we generally want temporal coherence as well between frames. Right. I mean, there's the original uh, Mertic style, just like uh, tons of impulse responses with small enough yep. steps and things kind of work out. I guess the only... Um, um, 
I mean, like that, that the comb could potentially fail if you always have the wrong part mm -hmm. of the sag over the side. Um, so I think there were a, a couple of a nice questions on the on the. So there was something about the computing the inertia tensors from the SDFs. Though uh, Bektash uh, had a question on um, the SDFs for the. Are you using the SDFs for the inertia tensors in any way? No, we generally use the embedded mesh for that. Uh, yeah. But you could. I mean, you could definitely like discretize the SDF and like integrate over the the volume to construct the inertia tensor. Yeah. That'd be a very direct way to do it. I mean, it's, it's available, the information is there once you have it. Right. Uh, Sheldon had a nice question as well about the scalability. So you have these SDF, SDF collisions. Uh, it, how do these things ultimately scale in comparison to like a rigid SDF to formal SDF? Uh, so I'm not totally sure if he's asking about like SDF, SDF where there's no embedded mesh representation. Uh, you know, that is a little bit of an open problem. Um, and, and I think you would end up, you know, it's similar to the volume contact work that I, I guess you did uh, previously, but you, I think you would need to generate some kind of discretization of the SDF intersection, uh, either by sort of fitting a grid over it or something like that. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you, uh, I think you could parallel, parallelize over that uh, discretization. Because it does seem like uh, this parallelizes amazingly well. Is that uh, is that the case? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is embarrassingly parallel uh, for sure, and and uh, yeah, one thread per element, and each thread is outputting one. So thread. I think Kartik uh, kind of had a similar question with the deformables. I mean, this projection from the coarse teapot SDF to the high res one. I mean, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I mean, there there's ultimately a multi resolution happening in that yeah. example. So the way that the deformable examples work is that, you know, for a query point in space, you need to find the the enclosing tetrahedron or the closest tetrahedron. And we, we use a, a BVH for that, uh, for that query. And once you have that, then you can use uh, the, the shape functions essentially to, to give you a linear mapping back to material space. Uh, and then, and then you have to go the other way uh, once you've, you've run the optimization. I would like to keep on asking questions of my own and from other people, but I think we are on a tight clock. Uh, I'm, uh, I was told that we have about three minutes per, per question. I'll just to let everyone know, uh, I would encourage all the, the authors and anyone who's on the, the Discord to um, uh, eventually we'll move over to the, uh, the voice channel or enter questions into the paper session uh, directly. So, uh, hey, thanks, Miles. And uh, let's move on to the second paper uh, in the interest of time. So, uh, Camille. Um, very nice work. I, I love the deformations. They look uh, super compelling. And uh, I have a, a a question that's of particular interest to me, having have, having had a look at some uh, wrinkle simulation in the past. Uh, I noticed uh, when you were poking this orange cushion, same color cushions that I was making wrinkles in, you get some interesting patterns. I don't know if you saw. It. I, I don't know if you mentioned the talk. I might have blinked and missed it, but I know in the paper I saw that you had some wrinkles that do form in concentric circles. And I'm wondering if you can comment briefly more about the, the wrinkle deformer uh, and how you might generate like star-like patterns. If I push into a cushion, the, the wrinkling uh, doesn't form in concentric rings, but it will form uh, like a, uh, when you, like in upholstery, you have like the star-shaped pattern of wrinkles that are, that are around where you poke it. Uh, in fact, uh, in this paper, um, the wrinkles that we show in the paper uh, are uh, some perturbation added on the curve profile. So it's based on the parameterization of the of the deformation of the deformable region. Do you think you could get one that's in a star shape pattern? Like I guess from the geodesic you can very easily uh, have a, a, a distance based deformation. But in terms uh, of getting this orthogonal type of up and down wrinkling in a uh, in a uh, yeah well I, I think uh, to control to more uh, to control more the, the wrinkles, you, you need to have a 2D parameterization of your deformable region. So uh, it, that way you can control uh, artistically the, the, the wrinkles and the position of the wrinkles, but you need to have a 2D parameterization. Yeah. Uh, just in this paper, we have only a 1D parameterization yeah. from the contact zone to the boundary, external boundary of the deformed region. So uh, I, there might ultimately be, a, yeah, I think the, the heat method, there's some other things that have uh, come out that have involved diffusion of frames as well. That probably would, it probably would just, um, yeah, interesting 
things for future work, perhaps. Uh, I, I so I, I noticed a question from Sheldon, which might was, might have been also related to uh, somewhat related to uh, thought that I had that uh, this in, invoked uh, uh, visions of like the implicit skinning of Vaillant, and uh, yes. and in that they had control over uh, getting some sharpness of the profile. Uh, it, this is, I guess, you can control this as well in your profile directly. Yeah, you can control the size of the bulge. You can control the amount of volume re-injected in the, in the model. Uh, you can have a sharp feature as soon as your mesh is not coarse. Uh, you, you need to upsample your, your mesh uh, if you have sharp features to have, um, to have a good deformation. But you can have sharp which features as perturbation of uh, on your profile curve. So the other related question is, I guess, my impression is that this is uh, likely much faster than the implicit skinning of Vaillant as well. Do you have a, an idea of uh, the, the speed comparison? Uh, of, okay, I mean, in some sense, you can get the comparable deformations for contact in certain scenarios in, in that implicit skinning work, right? But I think it's much more costly, do you know? Uh, I, I, we haven't, uh, go so far on the performance, um, um, on, on performance, uh, optimization, optimization, but, uh, we are, uh, we have some, um, I think we are more, we are faster than implicit scanning, but it's not the, the same, uh, application, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when we we in implicit scanning, uh, distant contacts, uh, for example, with the left end uh, colliding the right uh, arm, for example, is very expensive. And for us, there is no difference between uh, your your shikol, um, uh, bones, uh, joints uh, that are neighbors in uh, your skeleton. Uh, and uh, distant contacts. It's very. It's the same. It we're dealing uh, with the same method to do type of contacts. Whereas uh, in implicit scanning, um, distant contacts are more expensive. Very nice. I have more questions I would like to ask as well, but uh, maybe uh, we'll reserve these again for like the. Uh, the Discord channel, and, and again, I'll say um, I'm, I'm keen to move over to the Joyce voice channel to uh, continue the, the discussion. Likewise, with everyone who's on the Discord, that can um, feel free to ask their own questions instead of channeling them through me. Um, so let's move to the third paper. Thanks, Kemi. The uh, third paper, uh, Jungmin, very nice presentation. Uh, again, thinking about wrinkles. Uh, initially motivated by my thoughts of wrinkles on these cushions and the patterns of form. Uh, the thin shell models that you're using, I'm wondering if you uh, uh, do uh, know of a way to, to get uh, some, some wrinkling into, into these muscle-driven shells, if, if this is, these are things you've uh, explored. Like in older faces, for instance, with some aging, they, most of the faces are very uh, youthful looking. Uh, I think for the wrinkle simulation, we define some geometry characteristic for the skin mesh or uh, or the dynamic uh, that's our limitation and for the dynamic simulation uh, we confirm now the wrinkle cannot be present, represented because uh, it can only show the some kind of large deformation such as smile or browning the face and um, so do these do these not yeah. uh, arise naturally from the way the uh, the shells are attached to the muscles underneath? You do see them. Yeah. 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 Um, it was interesting to see that you're using shells uh, uh, quite wide, quite widely for these thin muscle representations as well. I think that's a very interesting approach that uh, I've not seen before in in in, in all of the work that's been done with. Uh, uh, basically anatomical models. Uh, and, and I guess this is my third question, which is kind of like the, um, uh, I guess there's this, um, I mean, I think it's sort of appreciated as a, a very wise approach to use uh, anatomical and biological accuracy in your models to uh, get the uh, 
uh, accurate deformations that you'd like to see. And it's a valuable way to get good deformations of human faces or, or bodies. But uh, I guess there's this challenge. I think you had a bit of it in the paper to say that we need these muscles here, need these muscles here to generate certain effects of, uh, uh, of deformations around the mouth. But uh, what is the high level strategy for ultimately choosing um, like a target given level of approximation of the muscles that are in the face to get the desired deformations? I mean, I guess if you're, if you're on like producing a, a, a movie, you want to have them efficient characters, but only put in the necessary model. So what was your strategy generally or advice to people doing this? Um, I think that could be the problem of the facial face targeting. So for the front face model, the muscle could be uh, transformed according to the transformation between the differences. So is it your question? Uh, am I understanding um, right? Well, I guess so. I mean, I just sort of uh, curious about the strategy of like, I think if I open up an, an, uh, an anatomy textbook of the face, I would, I, I could quite possibly be overwhelmed by the, uh, the number of little muscles that might be uh, mm -hmm. known to like doctors that might be doing uh, uh, like face surgeries. And, and I, I think the common belief in computer animation is we might not actually need that level of accuracy uh, in our anatomical models to get the desired results. And I just, um, I, I'm not sure there's a, uh, uh, I, I guess like people who've worked in this area have a, a good sense for like, what is the, what is the target number of muscles that you need to make it? Um, from now, I just uh, make a animation for just manually and I just pick which are the most, uh, most to be known as the, that generates a large deformation. And this is, uh, they, they are described in the anatomic book and for the more detailed or for the more muscles which are, you know, which can, which could be generate the motions more fluent. Uh, we, I think we have to afford the doctor's recommendation or have some more experiment. All right, thank you very much. I think I've probably used up uh, all the time and a little bit more. So uh, thanks for everyone for tuning in. And I would say, let's uh, move over to the uh, the voice channel uh, on the Discord uh, and use the uh, extra extra questions there if you want to like come up and pretend you're crowding the podium at the conference after the paper session and uh, come up and talk to the authors. Let's find them there. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to the papers chairs. And this concludes our uh, session on collisions and physics. Great. Thanks, Paul. And after a short break, we're going to be back with the second paper session.
Hello, so we're back live, um, I hope. I'm uh, Angelo Pesce, I'm a director of engineering for rendering at Roblox, and I hope you're ready for more papers because we have four amazing contributions in this second paper session about textures and geometry. So without further ado, let's uh, start with the introductions. Um, the first paper uh, would be three-layer approach to texture mapping and synthesis on 3D surfaces. Um, it is by Carsten Schuster, Philip Tretner, Patrick, Schmid Patrick Schmitz, and Live Cobber. Uh, the presenter is Carsten Schuster, um, who is a research assistant under the supervision of um, Dr. Uh, Live Cobber at the Visual Computing Institute at RWTH um, Aachen University. His research interest includes um, texture synthesis, geometry processing, and rendering. Uh, for Q&A, uh, Philip Tretner will uh, join as well. Then we'll move to the second paper, uh, Procedural Band Pattern, uh, by Jimmy Etienne and Sylvain Lefebvre. Uh, the presenter will be uh, Jimmy Etienne, who is a second year PhD student, and um, <clears throat> Sylvain Lefebvre is his uh, thesis supervisor at INRI Nancy in France. His main research domain is um, curved 3D printing. Uh, third paper is Lossless Geometry Compression for High Resolution Voxel Scenes by Remy van der Laan, Leonardo Scandolo, and Elmar Eisman. The presenter will be uh, Remy van der Laan, um, and he completed his uh, MSc degree last year at Delft University of Technology, uh, resulting in the paper being presented here. Uh, for the Q&A, um, Dr. Leonardo Scandolo will join, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Delft University of Technology, working on different topics in real-time rendering, editing, and visualization. Finally, we'll wrap it up uh, with Brent Burley presenting histogram preserving blending for randomized texture tiling. And Brent Burley is a principal software engineer at Walt Disney Animation Studios focused on rendering where he led the creation of Disney's Hyperion Renderer. He also developed the Disney BRDF shading model and the PTEX texture mapping system. Take it away. Hello, my name is Kerstin Schuster and I'm going to present our three-level approach to texture mapping and synthesis on 3D surfaces. Textures are a convenient way of adding fine-grained detail and visual appeal to geometric models. The actual mapping is often a very tedious task, with much manual work which in some cases can be assisted or even replaced by automatic texture synthesis. However, mapping textures to meshes can produce a number of artifacts. For example, repetitions, distortion, seams and incoherence, and blurriness or contrast loss. I will now give a short overview of related work in patch-based synthesis. In patch-based approaches, portions of texture are distributed over a mesh or a two-dimensional domain and patch borders are concealed afterwards. For example, by optimizing the location of the patch boundary or by blending color values. Heitz et al. introduced a histogram-preserving blending operator that can be used instead of linear blending. They describe a tiling of the plane where every fragment is composed of three parts of the same texture. Blending linearly clearly introduces artifacts, mainly by contrast reduction within the triangle grid centers. They overcome this problem by performing variance-preserving blending in a Gaussianized color space without significant performance decrease. Further extensions and implementation details can be found in the work by Brent Burley, who is also giving a talk in this paper session. Besides tiling of the plane, Heitz et al. also describe how triplanar mapping can benefit from histogram-preserving blending. As a quick reminder, triplanar mapping assigns three possibly identical textures to the three orthogonal axes of a coordinate system. Using two-dimensional subsets of the 3D world positions as texture coordinates, the three planes are blended according to the components of the world space normals. For tileable textures without strong patterns, this method produces good results and is very fast. However, if the textures do exhibit salient patterns, triplanar mapping can be problematic in blending regions. In this case, the surface normals of the front-facing part of the mesh are aligned with the spatial diagonal so that the three texture parts are blended with equal weight. Using histogram-preserving blending enhances the contrast, but the misaligned texture content still produces visible artifacts for those kinds of images. 
I will now present our approach. At first, I'll give an overview of our pipeline. Given a mesh and a texture set as input, we begin with the patch generation that consists of creating the patch layout and additional overlap regions. Texture coordinates and blending weights are computed individually for all patches and their overlap regions. If the texture content contains strong directional features or regularity, those are most likely misaligned, like in these two neighboring patches. The macro optimization enables a global alignment of patch texture directions, while the meso optimization attempts to align texture interest points from neighboring patches using a cubic transformation. Lastly, we perform overlap blending of patches in the microscale optimization before rendering the final result. The different optimization steps are actually what we refer to as the three levels in the title of our work. If the texture content is stochastic or very irregular, we can take a shortcut and skip the macro and meso optimizations. The first part of our method is the generation and texturing of individual patches on the mesh surface. The patch generation splits a given mesh into disjoint sets of triangles by growing from random seeds in a geodesic manner without crossing geometric features. Once all triangles are assigned, we perform a few Lloyd relaxation steps to increase uniformity of patches. Note that for non tileable input textures, the maximum patch radius RP is at least bounded by the desired texture size and world space, but can be restricted even further to reduce the chance of creating salient repetitions. Next, it is crucial to define overlap regions to enable content aware alignment of patches and to perform the final per pixel compositing. The region has to cover the typical size of texture features, but should otherwise be kept as small as possible. Once all patches and overlaps are created, we need to compute texture coordinates by mapping every patch to the two-dimensional plane. The choice for the appropriate algorithm is a trade-off between speed and quality, and we find a combination of least squares conformal maps and scalable locally injective mappings to yield good results quickly. We first parameterize all core patches with LLCM and reparameterize the problematic regions with slim. Finally, we parameterize the whole patch including the overlap region while keeping the core region texture coordinates fixed. The center image shows the final core region texture coordinates mapped to red and green color, and the rightmost image shows the resulting length distortion, which typically is below 5%. For the final pixel compositing in overlap regions, we need to define smooth blending weights that are always 1 for vertices in core regions and linearly fade to 0 at the overlap boundary. For that, we compute a harmonic scalar field where the values for the overlap boundary vertices and the core boundary vertices are fixed. Now that individual patches exist, we want to perform the different optimization strategies to align patches and perform the blending. I will start with the macro scale optimization. In this optimization, we align patches in a global fashion considering the texture coordinate direction. Of course, this step is only meaningful if the texture does contain directional features or regular part that should be aligned. We minimize angular differences across all core region boundary edges using the mixed integer programming formulation presented by Bommes et al. in the context of quadrangular remeshing. Angle differences are computed by flattening the respective triangles along the common core boundary edges. The mixed integer formulation enables us to compute the angular differences up to integer multiples of an optional symmetry angle theta s. In this example, the fabric texture is 90 degrees symmetric, so that the macro scale optimization can find a solution that looks more convincing than the initial random rotation of patches. The next step is the meso scale optimization. Up to now, texture patches are only aligned directionally. And if the texture contains prominent interest points, like in these two examples, they would not be guaranteed to match between neighboring patches. In an iterative process, we try to align those structural features, which we call interest points, of every patch to those of their respective neighbor patches with a cubic transformation. Consider an interest point that lies within the texture region belonging to a triangle of the overlap of patch PI. As it belongs to the overlap, it must be a shared triangle that is also part of a neighbor patch PJ. Using barycentric coordinates, we map the point from the texture space of PI to that of PJ. In the given example, five possible correspondences for the evaluated interest point are shown. Once we gathered all correspondences for all interest points in the overlap of patch PI, 
We use RANSAC and computer transformation that fits most of them. Aligning PI to its neighbors and repeating this process multiple times for all patches, a lot of texture features can be matched. In this example, no meso optimization was performed, so the features are only aligned in a directional way. Even without having a look at the patch layout at the top, the location of the patch boundaries can be guessed easily as they are clearly visible as artifacts. Those artifacts are reduced in the meso optimization by aligning most of the brick corners. The last of the three levels consists of the microscale optimization. This example shows a textured object after macroscale and mesoscale optimizations were performed. That means the texture features are aligned. But as you can see in the detail view on the right side, the patch boundaries are still visible as texture seams. Blending linearly conceals the texture seams, but introduces ghosting and low contrast areas. Note that the spots on the little squares are part of the input textures and not a blending artifact. Using the histogram preserving blending of Heitz et al., ghosting disappears and colors look more realistic. If height information is available, an alternative is to pick the color from the patch with the largest height value at every pixel position. This actually does not have to be a binary decision, but we can use a small ramp to interpolate between the candidates in a histogram preserving way. Instead of preferring the maximum height value, we can also favor the minimum of all height values. Here we depicted the different blending strategies side by side. The choice usually depends on the input texture set and on the taste of the artist. For rendering the final results, we describe two possibilities. Firstly, using the traditional way, patches can be baked into a texture atlas, which is easy as patches already have approximately uniform size. Note, however, that for large meshes, the atlas can be very memory consuming. As an alternative, we propose to directly render the patches and let the GPU perform the blending operations. At first, a depth prepass and a maximum height pass are performed. All fragments that pass depths and height tests are blended using maximum blending or additive blending before storing accumulated values and weights in a gbuffer. Finally, the gbuffer is resolved by dividing all values by the accumulated weights and blending related color transformations are performed. For purely histogram preserving blending, the maximum height is not stored and no fragments are discarded. All in all, direct rendering needs additional geometry for the overlap regions, but is otherwise very memory efficient, as all texture lookups are made into the input textures. Atlas rendering, on the other hand, is extremely fast, but the memory footprint can be enormous for large meshes. That was the description of the method, and I will now show some results. Reconsider the triplanar example from before, where a large portion of the surface consists of blending three textures. If the texture contains larger structures, artifacts cannot be prevented, not even with histogram-preserving blending. For comparison, the bottom row shows our patch-based approach. Artifacts are much less salient, as they only appear in overlap regions, and texturing within core regions is naturally coherent. This is the Amadillo Man, textured with a near-stochastic texture set. The final result consists of 201 patches, which are depicted in the center images. Like before, texture coordinates were mapped to red and green color. This example shows the synthesis result of an object with low triangle count and a high genus. The 200 patches are not very uniform, but patch borders are properly concealed. The basket texture on this triple torus was optimized using the macroscale optimization and max height blending that creates the impression of intertwining individual basket elements. For this result, we used a large 8K by 8K texture. Note that the performance of the meso step does not depend on the actual texture resolution, but on the number of interest points within the texture content. Speaking of performance, all shown examples took between less than 1 and up to 30 seconds to synthesize. The performance of the individual synthesis steps depends on the number of input triangles, the number of created patches, and the number of interest points in the input textures. Meshes with stochastic textures that do not benefit from the optional macro and meso optimizations are typically fastest to synthesize.
In contrast to the metal texturing example before, this brick texture is only 180 degrees symmetric, so the macro scale optimization has much less leeway to find a coherent orientation. Furthermore, we ignore geometric features and try to align interest points even across hard edges. This mesh does not have strong geometric features, but much Gaussian curvature, which prevents the mesoscale optimization from creating a result that looks convincing everywhere. In examples like this one, where regular structures cannot be aligned, none of the presented blending strategies can adequately conceal the inconsistencies. As the failure cases illustrated, regular textures on meshes with high Gaussian curvature can be problematic. But we found that we can improve on that a bit by introducing fault lines at feature edges where the artifacts are less salient. Furthermore, we completely ignore texture semantics and assume homogeneity of the input texture content. As future work, we want to improve the amount of user interaction for a better cooperation with our synthesis pipeline and make our interest points more expressive. Additionally, considering multiple materials for the texturing of a mesh would enable more possibilities, like terrain texturing. And for the same reasons, incremental retexturing after applying constructive solid geometry operations and sculpting could be explored. Finally, our direct rendering approach could be transformed into a less expensive single pass algorithm by restricting the number of blending candidates to the three most influential ones. We presented a patch based framework for the synthesis and mapping of different texture types. In summary, we split a given input mesh into overlapping patches that can be parameterized with low distortion. After computing blending weights and overlap regions, we can conceal texture seams using histogram preserving blending strategies. For regular textures that exhibit repeating or directional features, we perform additional alignment of neighboring patches. Lastly, we proposed a memory efficient direct rendering method as an alternative to texture atlases. This concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, my name is Jimmy Etienne, and I'm a PhD student in MFX team at Doria in France. In this work, we focused on producing bond patterns, such as the shader you can see in background. This technique allows to create various animations effects such as textile fibers that move along or are stretched when an object is pushing behind them. And the main particularity and interest of this method is that it allows to know in which band is located each pixel without looking at the neighboring pixels. And this method also permits to generate fastly curves with constant spaces such as streamlines. The streamlines are curves that follow the given orientation with, if possible, a constant offset between them, as shown in this picture. We can also find them over 3D surfaces and even volumes. We identified three main families tracing streamlines in a vector field from a starting point, or approaches based on a global periodic parameterization, and finally, approaches splitting and merging covering curves. As you can imagine, such algorithms are slow. And another black spot of these approaches is that we can't have a precise control of the density. There is always a frontier where every line is split into at every change in density. The method I will show you address partially the problem of the splits frontier and allows us to create and visualize streamlines in real time. As you may have understood, what we wanted to achieve was something fast, like really fast, that gives us the exact same control over the orientation and that gives us a better approximation of residency. Our real goal was not to generate images, but to generate passes for 3D printing, where the drawing of passes has to be called a high number of times. Okay, let's see how we achieve that. The originality of our approach is to define a lookup function that returns a unique integer identifying the bond. In our context, 
the lookup function is performed for a point P that exists in a domain omega and given to control fields. We call them U for orientation and D for density and returns a unique integer. Our domain omega can be in 2D or 3D and two control fields in the same space gives a single values as an output corresponding to the orientation and density of the given point. And with these two fields, we should control how the bond will behave. Moreover, these two fields can be linked in order to compensate the distortions. To summarize, our lookup function meets two control fields in input, one for the orientation and one for the density, and output a unique identifier. It has minimal computational and memory requirements and can easily be integrated as a pixel shader. In fact, all the examples that I will show here can be found in Shader Toy. And those specificities allow us to manipulate directly the bonds and their frontier to create different patterns, such as the hairs you have seen in the first slide, or the colored bonds that you can see here now. We can also generate evenly spaced bands if we correlate the density with the orientation, or even extract the boundary of those bonds, or even streamlines just by highlighting the center of those bonds. Now, let's do our first step into the algorithm. If we take our orientation field U, here defined with a linear gradient from 0 to 1, and we want to extract 10 vertical bonds, it is trivial to generate such bonds. What we have to do is to take the isovalues of that field with the desired spacing which is 0.1 in this configuration. We also want to identify the bounds, and to do so, we just have to take the integer part of U divided by S, with S the desired spacing. And with that, we can obtain directly the integer values uh, corresponding to the numbers. And now, if we want to vary the spacing, we can use our density field to control it. So, if we want a higher density, we have to reduce the spacing. So, the spacing is inversionally proportional to the density. And we obtain something like this. Okay, we can combine our two equations, and we obtain our identifiers for any point in space. But if we extract the borders for our two fields, we got these lines. The problem is that we want bounds that follow the isovalues of the field U, and in this configuration, our lines are far from vertical. And the further we will go, the more inclined the line will be. What we can do is to quantize the density field, D, in two levels, for example. And we can call this field QD for quantized density. Now, if we edit the equation, our result is two sets of lines that follow the orientation field. But there is no continuous bond anymore, and we have to find a way to connect them such as we can get bound. And to do so, we have to change the way we get the identifier. Previously, we had our lookup function, which was taking a point and two fields, and give us an ID. But as we use now a quantized density, let's call the previous identifier, obtained with this quantified density, a local identifier, because it depends on the local density. So, our lookup function, we have to do three things. First, find the local identifier to have our bounds. In second, link the borders, because as seen before, we need a way to connect the borders for the different densities. And in third, be able to have a unique global identifier for each band. Let's follow our lookup function from the beginning. So first, we have to find the local ID for the point P, 
In this example, we still have our two density levels as before, and if we look at the result of the equation, we get our local ID depending on the quantized density. Here, we got 32 for the point P in the blue density, but nothing prevents us to compute the identifier with other quantized density in the same point. So the identifier of P for the yellow density is 21. And we can use this idea to link the borders between fine and coarse densities. And the easiest way to do it is to link the borders from higher density to the closest border of lower density. So if we take this border and have a look to where it belongs in the lower density, we can find the closest border. So we know where to link the border and we can do it for every line. Sometimes multiple borders can go to the same lower density border. Now, to join them more smoothly, we can define an interpolation function and the interpolator is given by the position of the density within the density interval of the bracketing levels. Note that as we change the location of the band boundaries, depending on our interpolation function, the point P, which was previously in a band, may belong to another band after the interpolation. Like in this example, where P was previously in 33 and now belongs to 32. Now that all borders are linked, we have to get an identifier for each band to know if it is still the same band or another one, even if the density has changed. And the easiest way is to take recursively the ID of the lower density until the band has no predecessor, like 30, 33, and 35, which are appearing here. Now that all borders are linked and the bands identified, we can easily cross them. But if we do so, there is a high probability of collision between the identifier, like here, where two bands have the same ID. Thus, our approach is to number the bands in the same way we number leaves in binary tree. From the current band level, we move up in the hierarchy and insert a bit each time the band closes. Finally, the ID of the top level band is added at the most significant bits of the global ID here in Orion. In other words, the global ID is the ID of the top level bands here in orange, followed by the binary pattern of opening bands to reach the band enclosing P. So the main part of the identifier is the integer in orange, followed by the binary pattern, which starts with the yellow level and then the blue level and it goes on and on as long as we have bits to encode. Here is the result on the shader with a random color assigned to every band. And here, if we use the information we have on the identifier and the distance we are uh, to the closest border, we can add some texturing effects. Okay, if we have a closer look to our basic example, we can see that we are not splitting the path here. As I said at the beginning, we overcome the problem of having every split increasing the number of lines by a power of two. This is done through the quantization that gives us the control of the split. For step equal to 2, our technique behaves similarly to traditional C division approaches with one new bond opening for each coarser bond, effectively doubling the number of bonds at every level. Using lower values of step, our technique affords for a very progressive insertion of bonds at every new level. Let us consider a value step equal to n over n, with 
m and n integral forming an irreducible fraction and n between m and 2m. Such a step will open m minus m new bonds for every m bonds in the previous model. So, if we take m equal to 2 and m equal to 1, we got one new bond every one bond. We got the default behavior. Now, if we want to have one split, then one line that don't split, and another one that split, and on and on, we can take 3 and 2, which means that we will have one new bond every two bonds. A step of one or lower is forbidden. Otherwise, every x bond should have no split or even shouldn't exist anymore. And it cannot exceed 2 as the binary encoding will not support that. Let's see an example with a radial orientation field in blue and the density field set such as the bond tries to keep the same width. It is worth outlining that when step equal 2, which is a very typical approach, it gives only a crude approximation of the target density. Indeed, across an interpolation range, the produce density, see by that the number of bands, is wrong by as much as 50% in the middle. But when we took a step close to 1, there is more split, and the density is closer to the density requested. On the lower images, you can see a gradient in luminosity. It represents where are locating the density level after quantization. You can see that on the right image, there is much more step of quantization. Our technique opens multiple possibilities to produce bounds and curves patterns. We can even animate everything and interlace two fields based on their global IDs. The way we encode the global identifier gives us more information on appearing bonds, so instead of displaying the child bonds, we can let them be transparent. And by controlling the fields, we can forbid new bonds to appear and just stretch them. So, what can we do with these bond patterns? We use our technique to produce field patterns inspired from so-called cubic field. We extract the trajectories as the contours between pixels associated with different bounds IDs. This process is fast and robust. The key advantage is that our technique allows for spatial grading of density while producing very continuous passes. This has been implemented and chipped to users in our slicer for more than two years and was in fact the initial motivation behind this work. There are other contexts in additive manufacturing where either line of equal spacing are desirable. For instance, to generate field patterns following optimized field or for curved 3D printing, which is my thesis domain. We believe our approach to be especially promising to decompose a 3D shape into solid slabs before filling them with curved passes. What we have seen with the shaders we created is that with this technique, we can also have instant streamlined if we have an orientation field. And it may have other use, and feel free to play with it like I've done with the fake hair. Our technique has a number of limitations that can be problematic depending on the intended use. In areas where the density field D arises quickly, bounds will appear distorted. It would be interesting to apply filtering to D, such as to limit such defect. Intermediate density levels always exhibit partially deployed bounds. A consequence is that while the number of bonds remains correct, their spacing may look uneven in areas of constant scale where u is linear and d constant.
this situation may be minimized by modifying the interpolation profile to quickly open and close paths. In general, we believe it will be desirable to randomize the location where the bond split occurs. While our irregular splitting strategy with step inferior to 2 reduces split alignments, they remain located along either lines of D and not randomly distributed. Also, the numbering scheme relies on integers and might run out of numbers, being unable to distinguish between bounds deep in the hierarchy. Using wider integers is not too difficult in our context, as the only operation is to set bits in the IDs. Nevertheless, infinite zooming would require recycling IDs. To conclude, this very simple procedural shader is really prevalent. If you have a look to the paper, you'll see some links of some toy shaders that we've done by changing around 10 lines of code. So it's still always the same basis with just some modification to add some texturing effect. So enjoy it um, and have a good day and enjoy uh, the i3D conference. Thank you. Hi, my name is Remy van der Laan. Welcome to this talk on lossy geometry compression for high resolution voxel scenes. This research was performed at the Technical University of Delft in collaboration with Leonardo Scandolo and Elmar Eitzemann. So, voxels are a type of geometry representation. Uh, since they are stored in a grid, random access is usually fairly efficient, which makes it an attractive representation for real time rendering, for example. A major drawback, however, is their memory cost. And there are already numerous ways in order to reduce this cost. And in this talk, we're going to present a new type of compression that can improve the state of the art by around 20 to 50 percent at a small loss in quality. Our technique is targeted at high resolution voxel scenes. In particular, we only care about the geometry of the scene, so not about the, uh, the colors or the other kinds of attributes. To give a sense of scale, the scene here is at a resolution of 128,000 voxels along every dimension. So, in order to see the individual voxels, we have to zoom in quite far. So note, this resolution is the exact same anywhere in the scene. And only at this close-up viewpoint, you can see the individual voxels. A state-of-the-art compression method can store the scene at just over one gigabyte of memory in a format that can be rendered in real time. The compression method that we propose is a type of lossy compression. So this means that the scene is slightly altered from its original state. Uh, this is an example of what the artifacts look like. These changes are evenly spread over the scene, making them quite hard to notice. So this is then what the resulting scene looks like. So by changing these voxels, this particular scene can be compressed by around 13%. All types of scenes lend themselves better to our technique, which can then be compressed by up to 50%. Now, before I explain how our method accomplishes this, I have to go over some background information. So, imagine we have this scene, containing some geometry in the form of an S shape. So these examples I'm all about to show are in 2D for the sake of clarity, but they all naturally extend to 3D as well. Now, we can voxelize the scene by marking all of the cells intersecting the geometry as full and leaving the others empty. Storing such a grid naively, however, would cost a tremendous amount of memory, because the memory cost grows exponentially with the scene resolution. Uh, one of the ways to reduce this memory cost is by storing the scene in a uh, tree structure, such as a sparse voxel octree. We can build such a sparse voxel octree, or SVO for short, by first taking a root node that represents the entire scene. And then we recursively split up the scene into smaller quadrants, or octons in 3D, and these will be then the children of our root node. Now, if you split up the scene once more, you can see that two of these cells are empty. They don't contain any geometry. We don't have to store these empty cells in the uh, tree in order to be able to reconstruct the scene. And doing this also for the other nodes in this level, and you can see that only half of the amount of possible nodes has to be stored. And finally, we can uh, put these two by two cells as the leaves of our tree. We make a distinction between the inner levels and the leaf level of the scene, because they are treated a little bit differently later on. In the scene I showed at the start, at a resolution of 128,000 voxels, 
There will be 17 levels in total, and the amount of nodes would be in the order of billions. A few years ago, a method was proposed that could dramatically reduce the memory cost of the sparse voxel oak tree uh, without losing its traversal performance. The main idea of this method is that nodes that represent identical geometry can be merged together. This turns a tree into a directed acyclic graph, or DAG for short. To give an example, you can see that these two highlighted nodes represent identical geometry, as can be seen on the scene in the left. So we can just merge the two by removing one of them and pointing to the other twice. We can repeat this process for every level, and here we find two more identical nodes, and we can merge them in the same manner. Now, I will explain the intuition behind our lossy geometry compression method. The main intuition is, what if instead of merging just the identical nodes, we also merge the nodes that are almost identical, the ones that are very similar to each other. To give an example, here I have the same scene as before, but I've made a slight change. The single fox over here is no set. So these two quadrants are not identical anymore. But what if we were to ignore this voxel? Then the scene would look like this. And we would have reduced the amount of unique nodes in the sparse voxel deck. Now, applying such an approach on a large scale poses two main problems. How do we efficiently find these similar nodes? And how do we optimally cluster them together such that the voxel difference that we introduce is minimized? Let us first start looking into which nodes for it, it makes the most sense to be merged together. So since we operate on a sparse voxel deck, there are some nodes already that are referenced more than once. If we were to change the single voxel on these nodes, we would be changing multiple voxels in the resulting scene. So, therefore it makes more sense that we only merge together the nodes that are infrequently referenced. Here we visualize the location of the infrequently referenced nodes, as those marked in blue. And you can see that they mostly appear around edges, on curved surfaces, and on foliage. A little bit higher up in the graph, and you can see that these nodes become a little bit more common. Looking at the distribution of reference counts for the four lowest levels in the graph in one of the scenes we just saw, and you can see that most of the amount of nodes is only referenced once. By limiting our lossy geometry compression on just these nodes, we can minimize the voxel difference that we introduce. By default, our lossy geometry compression is just applied on these nodes that are referenced once. Now, when do we consider nodes to be similar to each other? For that, first we need to define a difference metric. We chose to simply pick the voxel difference between the underlying voxel grids of two nodes. So that means, for these two nodes, there would be a difference of one voxel. We then define similarity of nodes as when their difference is below a certain threshold. Um, we base this threshold on the height of the subtree of a node in the graph. So for example, here for node A, it has a height of 2, and for node B there will be a height of 1. We set this threshold to be the square of the height, because we aim to compress to these surfaces, which generally increase in a quadratic manner in 3D. So this means there would be a threshold of 4 for node A, and a threshold of 1 for node B. Additionally, we introduce a parameter, B, which can be used to influence this threshold, which is set to 1 by default. In order to find similar nodes in the whole graph, we need to compute the differences between pairs of nodes. This can be demonstrated with another example, in this case of four levels in total. Let us first attempt a naive comparison, by just comparing every node to every other node per level. We can represent these differences in a node similarity graph, where the edges are weighted by the differences between nodes. So, the difference between node B and C is 2, and the other two differences are 7 voxels. We can build such a similar graph for the level below as well. However, such an if comparison is just not feasible, because it's an ON squared operation, and there could potentially be billions of nodes per level. So, we need some optimization. We can apply what is known as a topology filter, in order to first find the nodes that are likely similar to each other. The main idea behind this step is that we can find identical nodes at a lower level of detail by ignoring the leaf level. Now if we start comparing subtrees, we can see that B and C share the same inner nodes, so we can say that their topology is identical. We can do this for the level below as well, and here we see that there are two sets of nodes that have shared the same topology, and we can work it as such. Now we just have to compare the differences between nodes that have the same topology, and this drastically reduces the amount of differences we have to compute, and additionally it prevents unconnected voxels from being added to the scene, because we enforce equality at a lower level of detail. To improve computation time even more, we have developed another simple optimization that can be just applied to the level of the leaves. It can be found in our paper. Now, 
these node similarity graphs can be arbitrarily large. How do we decide which nodes should be merged together? For a graph like this, do we pick two clusters? One big cluster, or maybe even three smaller ones? This is not a trivial problem. We need an algorithm that can find these clusters efficiently in a reasonable amount of time, even for high resolutions. Markov clustering is one of the algorithms that fulfills these requirements. Uh, this algorithm finds clusters of similar nodes that have a stronger connection to each other than to the nodes outside of their cluster. This is done by simulating random walks to the graph. It has several parameters, and the most important one of which is called the inflation parameter. And this basically decides the granularity of the clusters, or their size. By default, we use an inflation of 2. Now that we can find these clusters, the next step is to replace all nodes per cluster in the sparse fossil deck with a cluster representative. We simply chose to pick the node that is the most similar to all other nodes per cluster as a representative. So in this case, it will be node E. Now, to summarize, for every level in the graph, we first find the infrequently referenced nodes in the scene. Then we find nodes that are likely similar to each other using the topology filter. And only for these nodes, we compute the differences between each other. Then we filter out the differences that are above the threshold that we defined. And now we can cluster the nodes using Markov clustering. And finally, we replace all nodes in the sparse fossil deck per cluster with our cluster representative. Now, for some results, we tested our method on a variety of datasets, including some from interactive applications, a very geometrically complex model, a highly detailed sculpture, and finally, a CAD model. The conversion that we can achieve very significantly per type of scene. Our method is the most effective on Lucy, at over 50% conversion with default parameters, while barely reaching 15% for the power plant. This variation can be attributed to the scene characteristics. So Lucy, for example, uh, consists mostly out of curved geometry that is oriented in all directions. This means that the nodes are more likely similar to each other than completely identical. The opposite is true for the power plant. This scene mostly consists out of access online services that are compressed very well by the conventional sparse fossil deck already. Looking at the geomonic error that is introduced, you can see that it follows a similar trend as the memory reduction, but only for the lower resolutions. For the higher resolutions, it quickly drops down well below 1% in most cases. But again, this is an exception for the same reason as before. So, what does the geometric error actually look like? Here on the left, I show the original scene, followed by the scene compressed with default parameters, and on the right, the parameters are set to apply a high amount of conversion. Then, the resulting scenes look like this. If you take a closer look, there are some artifacts worth pointing out. Uh, you can see that some voxels are missing or have been added, but there will never be floating voxels because of our topology filter. In this short flight through, you can see just how many similar nodes can be merged together in this scene. It might not be captured well on video, but the added and removed voxels can be seen abundantly, spread out all over the mesh. For the Epic Citadel, the default parameters, the artifacts are hard to notice again, but with high conversion parameters, they become a little bit more obvious. What is the most obvious is that the rounded edges become a little bit more jagged. And this can be explained since our similarity measurement only looks at local similarity. It would be an interesting direction for future work to replace this with one that is more spatially aware. A flight through of the Epic Citadel also shows that many similar nodes can be merged together, but not as much as in Lucy. The terrain here has no high frequency detail, so the geometry repeats itself, which is compressed well by the conventional sparse voxel deck. This is also the case in the city area, but nevertheless, since we model the similarity globally, there are bound to be similar nodes, even here. As for the computation time of our method, we measure it in terms of minutes. Note that this chart has a logarithmic scale for both axes. For scenes that compress well, such as Lucy, the process can take up to two hours, while for the power plant it just is a matter of minutes. Looking at the distribution of computation time, you can see that most time is spent on the clustering process. Since we use an off-the-shelf clustering algorithm, there is certainly room for improvement in this regard. Now, to conclude, the goal of our method is to merge similar nodes together. The two main challenges were solved as follows. We efficiently find geometrically similar nodes by applying several techniques. Then we model the similarity between them in a graph, in which we find clusters of highly similar nodes that we then merge together back in the sparse voxel deck. 
Our method uses a sparse voxel duck as both input and output. So this means that our method can run in core, because the input is already highly compressed. And because the output is a sparse voxel duck as well, our method can be included in any existing pipeline where the sparse voxel duck is used without modification. Our method reaches an average compression ratio of around 27%, and there is a large dependence on dataset characteristics. It can be increased by around 5 to 15% by using more aggressive compression parameters. The geometric error is generally well below 1%, and the change voxels are evenly distributed over the scene, making them less noticeable. As for limitations, our similarity measurement is not optimized towards perception loss, so there is even a slight chance of holes appearing in your scene. And finally, uh, all geometry is treated equally, so even a geometry that might not be visible, such as that on the inside of solid objects, for example. If we aim just to make a geometry look the same when looking at it from the outside, there could potentially be many more matches to be found. Alright, and with that, thanks for tuning in. Hi, I'm Brett Burley, a principal software engineer at Walt Disney Animation Studios. And today I'll be talking about my Journal of Computer Graphics Techniques paper on histogram preserving blending for randomized texture tiling. But before getting into the details of the paper, I'd like to just provide a quick motivating example. Here's a typical texture. It's a repeating texture. So you can, it's tileable. But it has a problem that most tileable textures have. If you tile it too much, the repeats become obvious. So what if there was a magic button that you could press that would eliminate the repeats, but preserve the structure of the texture? Fortunately, there is such a method that was presented by Heitz and Naray at HPG in 2018. There were two new groundbreaking ideas in this paper. One was randomized texture tiling, and the other was histogram preserving blending, and I'll be going into detail about both of those. I should also mention that there was a follow-up work by Delio and Heights that was concurrent with my work. I'll be touching on that uh, at one point later in the talk. The two methods are complementary. With that, I'll start with an outline of the talk. I'll begin by reviewing the details of Heights and Array's method. Then I'll be talking about my contributions, which present an efficient implementation and some techniques for avoiding artifacts that can appear. Also, a method of using exponentiated blending weights that can reduce ghosting effects. And as a bonus, which was not included in the paper, I'll just talk about some considerations for implementing it in 3D. Beginning with randomized texture tiling, Heitz and Naray considered what would happen if you just cut out random hexagonal tiles from your input texture and, and just tiled them together? And then just repeated this process until you had as much texture as you needed. And this already, just this simple idea, works amazingly well. For many textures, you already you can't see the seams. Even under close inspection, it can be quite hard to see where the seams are. Here's one of the seams. But they wanted to do better than this. In order to eliminate the seams, they took a larger area of each tile, enough that would overlap the neighbors. And then in the overlapping regions, which form a triangle lattice, they blend the three nearest textures using the barycentric weights within each triangle. So you're always blending between three nearest textures. And this is what that looks like. And here's that same tile. While the seams are gone, this creates a new problem. You can see that the blended areas are kind of blurry and they lose their contrast where the center of the tiles remain sharp. This brings us to the second contribution from their work, which was histogram preserving blending. Here's the original texture and its histogram shown. And then when we blend it, you can see the effect on the histogram, which it becomes more narrow and it also becomes more Gaussian-like. Heitzen Naray observed that if the input texture had a Gaussian histogram, 
When you blend independent samples from a Gaussian histogram, you also get a Gaussian histogram, but one that's narrower and in a predictable way. And then to restore the contrast, you merely have to scale around the mean and get the original distribution. So with this insight, they, all they had to do was transform the input texture to have a Gaussian histogram, do the blending, and then restore the contrast, and in the end, undo the Gaussian step. Here's the input texture again, and here's what it looks like when we Gaussianize it. So you see a little bit of a color shifting, but the structure of the texture is preserved. Now when we blend, we get a similar result to before, but we can apply a contrast operator, and this is really the magic step. This brings back all the detail in the blended regions and really makes the seams disappear. And finally, it's just a matter of inverting the Gaussianization step to get the original histogram. So how do we implement this Gaussianization? The way Heitz and Array did it, first they generated the middle image, which is a random texture that happens to have a Gaussian distribution of colors. And then they used a process of rearranging these pixels in order to approximate the structure of the input image. To do this, they used a 3D optimal transport solver. This is rather daunting to implement, and it also can take some time to process. It can take several minutes, even on a low-res texture like this. I should say that that's only a pre-process, so it's not something that you would pay at runtime, but it does add time to your texture authoring. Finally, to invert the Gaussianization, they used a 3D LUT, which they also generated as a pre-process using optimal transport. To produce our method, I had the observation that if you simply transformed each channel through the CDF of the histogram, you'll get a uniform distribution. And from there, it's a simple matter to transform through the inverse CDF of the Gaussian distribution to get a Gaussianized texture. And each of these can be done using a single 1D LUT that could be computed trivially on texture load. And then to invert the Gaussianization, we also use a 1D LUT per channel. So now that we've talked about how to Gaussianize a texture and blend and de-Gaussianize, let's take a closer look at contrast restoration. With the method of heights and array, as I already mentioned, it's just scaling around the mean, which is a linear transformation. In this case, you might notice that values can go above one and below zero. And this might raise an alarm if, if you know anything about textures and that that might introduce clipping, but this isn't a problem if you use the infinite Gaussian distribution as they did. The infinite Gaussian distribution uh, goes naturally beyond zero and one, and when you invert it, it brings the entire infinite range back into zero to one. However, if we want to use a LUT, like I'm proposing, then this clipping can become a problem. Here's an example. So here's the tiles on the left without blending, and then once you blend them, these values that are near the transition between tiles that get the most blending can exhibit clamping artifacts. This doesn't happen very often, but it, it's caused by this limiting the values from zero to one from the infinite Gaussian. Here's a comparison if you do use an infinite Gaussian as in Heisen Array's work. While technically it's not clipped, it still looks a bit compressed. So we wonder if we could do better than this. So what, what we did, we started with the truncated Gaussian, which is defined strictly within zero to one and derived a contrast operator, which is shown in yellow here. You'll notice that this contrast operator keeps the values within zero to one and rolls them off smoothly. This looks like it would produce 
quite a drastically different result. However, when you look at the contrast restoration and Gauss ionization combined, it, it's a very subtle difference from the original. If we look at just the end of the transformation, you'll see the difference magnified. And you can see that just on the first, you know, the first and last 4% of the uh, histogram range, the values are lifted a bit and smoothed off more gradually. Here's what it looks like as a result. You can see that the compressed effect is gone and most of the texture is indistinguishable. So this works quite well and it's quite simple to implement. The details are in the paper. One thing that can happen with transforming each color channel independently is you can get color artifacts such as shown here. Here's three examples. Most textures do not exhibit this, but these are some that I found that do. They're very subtle colorations in the close-ups. We found that we can avoid these colorations by first transforming the texture to YCBCR space where the luminance is separated in the Y channel and then performing histogram preservation only on the Y channel. This does sacrifice slightly some color contrast, but it's not typically noticeable. I should also point out that Delio and Heights in the follow-up work came up with a different method to address this problem. They transform the input texture to a color space which is rotated to align with the eigenvectors of the color space, and this minimizes the variation in the secondary dimensions. This works well when a texture is dominated by one color. Anyway, that's an alternate method that you can read about. At this point, I'd like to present an additional feature that complements the previous method. Here we have a blending weight shown for a, one of the textures over a triangle. And we have the original weight, W sub I. There would be three weights, one for each of the textures being blended. Our contribution is to take that weight and raise it to a power of one over B, where B is an input parameter. When B is one, which is the most amount of blending, we get the original linear blending shown on the left. As we decrease B to zero, we reduce the amount of blending and the blended region becomes sharper. It doesn't introduce any discontinuity, but it does narrow the area that's where the blending is visible. This can address an, a ghosting artifact that can appear with the method when the weights aren't exponentiated. Here is the, the example from earlier shown with the, the uh, original linear blending weight. If you look, you can see some ghosting of the pattern where the stones aren't quite clean and clear. If we reduce the blending amount to 0.25, everything just becomes sharper and cleaner and the uh, seams are still not visible. This value works well for most textures, but it can be useful as an artist controllable parameter. Here's another example where the ghosting is quite distinct in the blended regions. And again, using the value 0.25, it's cleaned up significantly. And a, one more example of a rock texture where it's very muddy and the grout lines are not, dis, or the mortar lines are not very distinct. But when we decrease the blending weight, then it becomes much cleaner. Finally, I'd like to talk about how this method can be extended to three dimensions specifically to apply to an arbitrary three-dimensional surface without the use of UVs. The usual method of doing this is using a triplanar projection as shown here. But as with any triplanar projection, you get seam artifacts where you transition from one primary plane to another, as in along these cube edges. We found a simple trick that can improve 
This result in eliminate these seams. This trick is instead of blending each plane separately and then blending the three planes, to just take all nine samples from the three planes and blend them all at once. So we have nine weights and we normalize them all together. The result is something that looks a little bit like a Voronoi pattern, or you see the hexes kind of wrap around the edges of the cube. This is really ideal. Here's what it looks like when we increase the blending. Now this method doesn't work really well with a regular texture like this. It doesn't preserve the regular structure, but if we put in a natural texture, now it works great. And in fact, if we zoom in, we can see that the texture naturally wraps around all aspects of this 3D geometry without any visible seams and with all the detail and contrast preserved. And that brings me to the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for watching and I would also like to thank I3D for inviting me to present my work here. Thank you. Hello, uh, we are back live and we will uh, proceed with the Q&A session. Uh, I will just take a couple of questions for each paper and then of course uh, feel free to drop on the chat on the Discord server to uh, mingle with the authors. Um, so for the first paper um, for um, Custer, um, we got a question from YouTube um, asking, is there uh, any assumption in the process that the mesh is uh, watertight? Yeah, um, no, there's no such assumption. Actually, we do not require the mesh to be watertight at all, but I figured there are no non-watertight meshes in the presentation, actually. Yeah, so what you could do, for example, is take a, a 2D plane, which is subdivided, and perform our method, and you have the, the, the typical planar texture synthesis. And I may like extend this question, like, uh, do you know of any kind of limitations um, on the mesh topology uh, that would break this method? Or like, I can take a generic polygon soup and expect it to work? Well, of course, you need the topology. So to grow the patches, but if the mesh is not too uh, malign, I think it uh, should be okay, yes. Or I don't know, uh, Philip, maybe you want to add to that? Uh, did you encounter any problems? No, basically if the triangles are too big, we subdivide them, so they have to be smaller than the patches, obviously. Um, we will not grow over non-manifold edges and over top uh, topologically not connected edges, obviously. But apart from that, there is no limitation. Cool. Um, and I have a question for you guys. Um, the presentation did mention um, extending the future to user input, which is very dear to me, our direction. Um, would you be able to elaborate a little bit? I would imagine that it would be possible to change already like the maybe size and density of the patches over the mesh. Uh, do you think it would be possible to have um, multiple source patches, uh, something like similar to what we do with one tiles or other ways of like tiling different uh, patches of the same material together? I'm not sure whether I understand that uh, question correctly. Um. Uh, so, um, I wonder what are you thinking in terms of user control, user input on that direction? And mm -hmm. I wonder um, if this can be extended to more than one input uh, texture, to uh, either multiple materials okay. or multiple samples of the same material. Okay, at first uh, for the user intersection, uh, user interface part. Um, Yes, uh, right now you can, you have constants uh, for the um, patch radius, for the overlap sizes, and for the meso snapping radius. And, uh, but of course, you, can, you could also define a spatially varying density map, for example, because um, all the patches are grown iteratively. So it would be no problem to have spatially varying sizes of patches, for example. Cool. 
Uh, all right, uh, let's move to um, the second uh, paper, Procedural Band Patterns. Um, so this presentation actually mentioned um, that was uh, originally motivated by 3D printing. Uh, could you describe a little bit uh, how that works in 3D? Is just like on a uh, voxel grid? Um, does any change to the method uh, need to uh, be performed? Um, actually, in, to make it uh, work in 3D, uh, we just use like a, like if we do like a, with a, a, a swipe line, like we just uh, take another plane uh, uh, higher and shifting all the bands, like uh, if we consider like moving on the left uh, by uh, like, I don't know, two millimeters. And uh, so the lines will uh, move up and we can swipe or is you can just consider it as uh, the animations like uh, the animation you can see it as uh, it goes uh, through the wall volume or stuff it will act exactly the same i see very interesting um and i have a question on this as well i was just toying with the shader toys which are of course like amazing and uh, always nice to see those kind of things in in papers and I think that there uh, you run this um, global ID propagation uh, just in a function. So it's just a single pass shader that creates those procedural band patterns. Um, I wonder if uh, that is um, the best way of implementing it or is it just because of the limitations of shader toy. If in production you would do it um, as a global kind of pre-process in a compute shader or something to uh, do that iterative propagation of the um, ID, uh, global IDs to the bands. Mm. I I don't thought about it actually because yeah we were like playing with shader toy because it's easy to test and and do so yeah we ended up with just one function but maybe we can do it iteratively because yeah we look at other like if there is another band so. Like how how Which, far does it does that uh, process have to go? Like does it have to? If I am at the bottom of the bands, does it have to iterate all the way to the top of the density? Um, for uh, what we've done, um, yes, but maybe we can uh, fast uh, this process be faster because we can already know uh, in which density we should be at the higher level and stuff. So. We should be able to, let's say, guess where we should end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, it was really an amazing work. And then again, very, very fun. I, I hope that uh, some people in the shader toy community start playing uh, with those procedural methods. Um, thank you. And um, I'm just monitoring as well uh, Discord and YouTube to see if I don't want to miss any of the user questions. Um, we had a few questions for um, Remy and Leonardo on lossless geometry compression. Uh, so let's go through those first. Um, from Discord, uh, we have someone asking, uh, are rotations, uh, for example, uh, multiple of 90 degrees, encoded in graph edges to identify similar voxel, or is the process completely access aligned? Uh, yeah, so currently uh, we just limit our compression to access aligned surfaces. Uh, to I think it would work. There's already a paper out from a few years ago that uh, encodes uh, symmetry on the edges uh, in every pointer. That is quite efficient as well, but on different kind of scene characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, and it would theoretically be possible to apply it also in our technique, uh, but it does add some complexity because there could maybe be a subtree that is then a match sym symmetrically, but it is also a match lossy to another node. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to take care of edge cases like that, but uh, it would definitely be possible. So in, in effectively to take into consideration those things, you would um, need to expand the number of things that you search for similarity yeah. by the number of symmet symmetries that you're considering. Yeah, so the search base would increase, but yeah, it's, uh, it's possible. Cool. And I got a, a second question from Discord. Um, 
Uh, it says, just skimming through the lossy geometry compression paper, the related work say voxel gives random access. But if one is building a uh, graph, um, is this lost? Um, yeah, so there is no real direct random access. Um, maybe that was mis uh, misworded in the paper. Uh, but random access is still quite efficient. So it's basically just an octree. So uh, there are very a lot of uh, uh, papers that or techniques that use an octree for real-time visualization, for global illumination, or uh, ambient occlusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, the traversal method is exactly the same for a sparse voxel deck as well. So you don't really, uh, yeah. So it, it, it's just fairly efficient even for real-time applications. Cool. So we still can randomly access things, but basically you traverse from the top to the bottom every every time that you need an access, and you rely on the tree not to be too too deep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this kind of brings uh, a follow-up question from me. Uh, I wonder because um, we've been doing those kind of things in in video games, as, as you say, like um, arc trees and traversing for each voxel or for each you know uh, point on a surface and so on and so forth. And of course, when you start implementing those things in practice, uh, sometimes you don't you want to have even shallower trees, right? And so you just widen them. So instead of using an arc tree, you start using nested grids. This is the same for you know ray tracing acceleration structures, very yeah. known kind of deal. Uh, did you did you experiment or did you think of uh, or do you believe that this could be extended uh, beyond octrees to uh, wider uh, nested grids? Um, yeah, so you mean like encoding more bits per uh, per node, right? So you could have some attributes in there as well. Uh, well, I mean, so each node instead of pointing just to eight children, it may mm. be like uh, I don't know four by four by four uh, mm. grid of and so on and so forth. So then you get shallower trees. Um. Uh, yeah, definitely, you could do that. But just a general problem with sparse voxel decks is that the more information you encode in every node, the lower probability is that there will be an identical match in the uh, per level. Mm. Uh, so there are some there, there were some experiments. I also tried this myself to encode some attributes for every node as well. But mm -hmm. that just decreases the probability that you can find identical nodes. So the amount of matches the sparse voxel deck construction algorithm finds are so low that it's not really feasible for higher solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so some, there are some alternative papers for encoding attributes where the, uh, every node has an index in an external data structure, and that then points to some color or some normal data, uh, mm -hmm. and that compresses uh, quite well. All right, and, and that kind of knocks off my second follow-up question, which was about non-binary voxel data. Um, mm -hmm. And in that case, so you're mentioning uh, do you think that this is something that can be applied um, just to the leaf nodes, or you would need to store the extra data at all levels of the hierarchy because you are like supporting a kind of multi-resolution traversal or something like that? Uh, yes, yeah, so for like bitmap data, you mean? Um, mm. uh, uh, for for the, me the method that I mentioned earlier, that you uh, store in an external data structure, you could do that for every node in a graph also in the higher levels. Mm -hmm. um, but for if you want to store the, uh, the extra information in the in the tree itself or in the graph itself, um, I guess it would be more efficient to just uh, memory efficient to store just in the leaf nodes. Uh, but yeah, that doesn't mean you need to traverse the, the whole to, to the bottom of the tree in order to get those attributes, so that wouldn't be as traversal efficient. Cool. Thank you. Uh, actually, just a, a comment, not not really a question. Um, this kind of um, block similarities um, and, and search for similar things are also um, one method of lossy um, texture compression when you have like um, GPU compressed data. So I wonder if some of the algorithms like the Markov chain um, uh, similarity that, that you devised here could be applied um, in that domain as well. That would be very interesting to see as kind of a follow up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for, for the answers. And let's move to the questions from the last paper from Brent. Um, let me just have a quick skim to see if we got anything else on our social media channels. Um, all right, um, question from Eric Haynes for Brent. Um, our thoughts about using deep learning CNNs are related to helping creating more plausible blends. 
Well, I think the beauty of the histogram blending, especially with the randomized texture tiling, is it could be done on the fly as lightweight and you don't have, you don't need any knowledge of the neighborhood. Uh, and you can actually do a lot with that. You can play with the mapping, you can do rotations and warps, and you can snap to a grid and align features like uh, bricks. Uh, one thing I discovered though, is if you do like do things that break the independent sample assumption, like if you align bricks so that the mortar aligns with the mortar, then the histogram blending uh, really doesn't work anymore. You, you increase in contrast where the statistics aren't as predicted. So I think I, I, for these reasons, I found Karsten's work rather inspiring at the start of the session where you have knowledge of the geometry and the patches and you and the explicit overlaps and you have, you know, it's still very fast and you have some amount of uh, time you can afford for pre-processing. In that kind of a scenario, I would imagine learning a, a deep learning approach could improve things. And I think there's some really interesting applications, especially in the production in our studio where you're doing model transfer or you're fixing up a model after you know edits, uh, those sort of things. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to look at that. Cool. Yeah, it's very interesting how your uh, true uh, papers were uh, fairly related. And so you get also um, a related question from me, uh, which would be then again about um, thinking of um, supporting more than a single source texture source patch. And kind of uh, as a thing, like w with my team, we were looking at our terrain rendering and we were, of course, um, trying to apply this uh, fantastic new method. But one thing that we, we um, had to fight with is that um, as far as I know, it's not simple to extend this if you want to have multiple materials um, blended all together. I guess the, what you would need to do is to do your procedural, your tiling um, per material and then just compute the blending between them. Uh, am I incorrect there? Uh, do you think there could be a future where this can be extended to more than one source texture? Yeah, so the way we texture our surfaces, we have a large number of arbitrary channels. And if you want to use this hex tiling and histogram preserving blending, as long as you're using the same tiling parameters, the, the randomized texture is going to line up among all the channels. So say you had a substance uh, material that you generated, a tileable texture, it, it, you know, it could have a whole stack of parameters that it's producing, those are going to stay together and they're going to blend, you know, in, in concert. And the way I'm doing the histogram preserving blending per channel, you would still be able to do that over an arbitrary number of channels. The only thing that really might not necessarily work is the uh, YCBCR assumption for uh, avoiding coloration artifacts. Uh, you may not even have artifacts or you may be able to use the eigenspace approach mm. to improve things. But I, yeah, I think it's very applicable to arbitrary channels. But what if I have something like, say, a grass and a rock? Uh, how would it be possible to, to apply this method to like two completely different uh, surf, uh, materials? don't recall if I put in the paper. One of the examples uh, I experimented with quite a bit was a grass with, I don't know if there were rocks, but flowers, other, other material things. With natural sorts of textures, things just kind of seem to work, especially when you can uh, reduce the, uh, how, how much the, the blend moves into each other. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look closely, if, you certainly will get things that aren't quite plausible, but at a distance, I think it all works very well for naturalistic sorts of things. Cool. Uh, all right, let me give a last look over our social and otherwise I'll thank you all the authors uh, for being here. And then again, um, if you want to drop in our Discord channel to like uh, have a chat with 
uh, everybody that presented today. Um, you're very welcome to do so. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Angelo. Uh, and I believe people have also been using the uh, the voice chat feature of Discord to talk about the papers after the, the paper sessions. Uh, I think Eric has a couple of words to say before uh, we start tomorrow. Right. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, we have some last uh, late breaking news, as they say, when we have it, as we come in the air. Um, this concludes the first day's session, and we hope you enjoyed it. But the news is, is that uh, tomorrow's keynote by Rachel Rose at ILM and Maddie Hoffman at Lucasfilm uh, will be a live presentation only, not recorded and archived. Um, so for this one, you can't say, I'll watch it later, I'll sleep in or whatever. You have to show up tomorrow to see it. Uh, thanks for attending. Thanks for asking questions, and we'll see you tomorrow.